Good afternoon, traders. Uh, thanks for joining us here in this uh, in this event today. Our annual fireside chat with Convergent Trading. We have a lot in store for you here. Thanks for joining us. Derivatives trading is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. The opinions and information performance shared of the guests belong to the guests and does not necessarily represent the uh, opinions, interests, or um, or anything to do with convergent trading. Uh, the the content received here is for entertainment and educational purposes only. So we have a lot in store here. We've got uh, we've got a, a big agenda. First up, we're gonna just cover what um, what we're gonna you know what this is all about. Really, this is a casual one time a year event. Just grab a cold or warm drink, whatever suits you. Uh, we will just uh, talk about what uh, we're doing, what convergence about. In case you're new, just a quick intro there, and then we will cover what's going on in the big picture. We have a guest for that. We're going to talk about uh, some trading techniques that you may not have heard of before. We have an expert on that. And then we'll talk about sharpening your mental game for 2023, preparing for 2023. And then we'll have a discussion with the CT Mavens, um, other tr experienced traders from Convergent Trading to discuss what they've seen this year, what they've had to deal with, and so on and so forth. So... Here's what we're going to start with, what this is all about. We'll have the big picture with Jeff Snyder. We'll have tech analysis and dropping anchors with Brian Shannon. We have assessment and goals in, in spirit of the uh, World Cup. I don't know if you watch that Morocco-France game today, but man, brutal. Uh, so we'll have Jared Tendler for that. And then we'll be talking about... Um, been there, done that uh, with traders Brian B and John 471. So without further ado, let me bring on the Convergent Trading Mavens. How are you guys? Doing well. Very good. Thank you. How's the trade today? Big day, another big day, two big days in a row. Typical M uh, FOMC day starting out in the morning, I'd say, and then uh, a lot of excitement in the afternoon. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we'll, I, I can't wait to have Jeff on uh, to talk about how we just, the market kind of rapidly shoots up and then it just trickles down. So it looks like fireworks, you know, very yeah. slow, right. stair <laughs> step down. It did that on CPI yesterday, did that on the Fed a little bit today, although the Fed, it kind of shot up earlier and then just came, came down um, all afternoon, just ground its way down. Um, so you, you heard the, uh, you heard the, uh, agenda here. You saw the agenda here. Feel free to comment where you feel you want to, to ask questions of any of the guests. So with, uh, without further ado, we'll bring Jeff on and, uh, we'll talk a little bit about who Jeff is. So Jeff, uh, very interesting fellow. He's, uh, he's one of my favorite uh, blog reads and podcast. Je Jeff is a chief strategist at Atlantis Financial and co-host of Eurodollar University podcast. Uh, I really want to invite you all to follow that link. Go to ct.pro forward slash Jeff dash Snyder dash pod. This will drop you into the Apple podcast screen. And from there, you can uh, subscribe to the podcast. It's completely free. Jeff has been dropping a lot of episodes lately. It seems like I'm getting one every couple of days, whereas before it used to be about once a week or so. Uh, so I, I'm really happy to see that uh, they're also shorter, 15, 20 minutes, and they're really instrumental at keeping me up to date on what to, what to, how to read into what the macro picture is doing. And of course, please follow Jeff on Twitter. You can find him at twitter.com forward slash forward slash Jeff Snyder underscore A I P. So Jeff, um, let's dig right in. It's FOMC day today. It was CPI day yesterday. Tomorrow we get the Swiss national bank, the bank of England and the ECB. 
Uh, and we have uh, Triple Witching Friday, Options Expiration Friday to boot. So this week has been just uh, full, of, uh, full of knockout punches. The FOMC was just announced today. What is your take on what they did uh, and what j Powell has said? Or what did the man say? Be cursed to live in interesting times. I mean, that that goes triple, quadruple, quintuple for this week. It's just one big thing after another. Well, I mean, to start with, the FOMC was, I think, pretty much predictable. Um, policymakers have, first of all, indicated their disdain for how the market is treating recent data, particularly CPI yesterday, but even before then. Uh, go back to the CPI from October last month. Uh, they don't like to see long-term rates fall because they believe that that undoes some of the tightening they're attempting to do. And so today's hawkishness um, was, was a, an intentional response to the market, which is really rejecting their premises here and doing it ex exceptionally <laughs> strongly, in re not just in the U.S., but all around the world where we see yield curves inverted. So the Fed is saying... We're going to raise rates further, and then we're going to keep rates up higher higher for longer, where the bond market, the derivatives markets are saying, no, you're not. <laughs> In fact, despite the hawkish statement by the Fed, you look at the yield curve or Eurodollar futures curve, it was completely unchanged today, almost completely identical after that initial knee-jerk reaction, which was, you know, sell off, rates go higher. Even the short end of the yield curve didn't move. Uh, a lot of the bill yields were actually a little bit lower. So the market said, Jay, FOMC, you guys want to be hawkish, but we don't think you're going to be. We think that there's a, a trajectory for rates to go lower, not in 2024 or 2025, but much sooner than that. So that just hmm. builds off of yesterday's CPI. Jeff, Do you feel... Oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Is it almost like the market's saying, we're just waiting for you to get out of the way so we can start going up again? Which market are you talking? You mean, but the stock market or yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I think there's there's a little bit of a realization in the stock market that the reason the bond market is rejecting these rate hikes is probably not good for stocks, and that really that goes back number one to the CPI. What the CPI has been telling us for several months, which is that consumer price pressures has have eased off materially. We saw that not just in the CPI, but also certain parts of the producer price index, and then today. Uh, kind of lost in the FOMC. We've got import-export prices, which like the CPI, have been decelerating markedly since June. In fact, everything points to June. You look at the yield curve, the yield curve was modestly inverted between March and June. And then suddenly late June into July, it was like it went nuclear. Um, and then, of course, you see the CPI change. You see the producer prices and prices around the world change. I also see a lot of economic data that's begin that's begun to soften. And the market is again looking at the uh, the condition on, with consumer prices and saying there really isn't that basic premise to continue hiking rates because consumer price situation has changed considerably. And then that, that points to the reason why it's not because of rate hike, because then we're going back to June here. It's likely because the global economy is heading headlong into recession, which, of course, is consistent with not just these curves being inverted, but so heavily inverted, which is why you get into a few future near term future scenarios with interest rates falling. So back to your original premise, the stock market wants to love the fact that maybe rate the, the bond market is saying rate hikes are done because, you know, lots of lots of folks believe the stock in the stock market believe that rate hikes are the reason stocks have been lower all, all year. And so the end of the rate hikes kind of brings back the idea of the punch bowl. The punch bowl's back, baby. Yeah. Except yeah. if the bond market scenario plays out and we, we we do run headlong into a global recession, which might be, you know, given the level of inversions here, it's not looking all that great. Maybe that's not so good for the stock market after all, which I think you guys know, you never know in the in the short run, especially in intra, any intraday setting. But I think that's why the market was at first kind of pleased with the, whatever what, what transpired and then said, oh, maybe not. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. You know, uh, I had uh, I was on a show earlier today um, with uh, Macro Alf, whom you've had on your uh, podcast, as well as uh, Andreas Steno. And, you know, they, they emphasize the point that 
you know, even if inflation is at zero percent, the 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 they use a three month uh, annualized. Even if it's at zero percent, prices have already gone up quite a bit. And even if the Fed decides, okay, we're not going to do twenty five basis points. It's it's we're not we're just going to back off for a minute. Still, companies in the S and P five hundred uh, are paying what twice as much for the for the cost of money but we know that if they say we're going to hold right here the market's going to be you know the S&P 500 will be above you know 4500 the the Dow will be over 35000 and so on and so forth how how does that work you from the institutional side why would a uh why would traders and desks think that this is great news i mean the fact is we're we're still we still have had a lot of inflation it's not like negative inflation or deflation or and interest rates are haven't fallen we haven't cut 400 basis points it's just going to stay high so the cost of money is still going to be high so how is this good news for the stock market well i think that's the you know the 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 real tug of war in the bond market is between those who believe like Jay Powell, interest rates are going to stay high as you're describing, but more and more the markets are projecting lower rates, materially lower rates. And when you look at the level of inversion, for example, in something like Euro dollar futures, that's, you know, we haven't seen anything like this since 2007. And, and some of this level, some of that inversion is unprecedented, which indicates that a whole bunch of the market isn't thinking that rates are going to stay where they are or modestly decline as the Fed thinks into the long run, we're looking at scenarios which produce immediate rate cuts that become aggressive. So there's a lot of the market that is thinking whatever happens between now and whatever the near term is, it leads to a situation where the, uh, the Fed isn't just stopping its rate hikes, it's actually turning completely around and aggressively cutting them. So but if you're if you're thinking that the end of rate hikes is because inflation pressures are gone, that sounds like a very good scenario. And as you said, Murad, it's not like that consumer prices are going to go back to where they were in 2020. That's not the really the, the case here. Uh, and that's really historically speaking, when you go into these supply shocks, that's never really what happened. Uh, consumer prices stop accelerating, and that's the end of the inflation. It's not like we go back to where we were. So we all have to adjust to likely higher prices, which we hope that we adjust to them in a good, positive way, which is, I think, what the, the most optimistic <clears throat> scenario is, is that even though we've absorbed a tremendous price shock, we can absorb it reasonably well, because if we believe in Jay Powell's story, the labor market's fine, the economy's relatively healthy. So then the end of inflation would be a good thing. But the bond market, like I said, is pricing something very different that the end of consumer price pressures might be for something very different than just the end of consumer price pressures. There's, there's sort of a, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel might be a freight train moving in our direction. Yeah. So the next question we had for you is what will the Fed have to do for 2023 or in 2023 to bring us back to their dual mandate? So you know, you wake up tomorrow, you look in the mirror, you're Jay Powell. What are you doing to bring us back to 2%? And what is the other mandate? Maybe 4%, 2% on inflation and maybe 4% or something on uh, employment. I'm not sure if there's even a number for employment. So what has to happen here in the, in the next year or so? That's really the question where it's, it's the mandates are being crossed. Uh, the Fed all year has said, we're now a sole mandate institution. We don't care about the unemployment rate anymore. We're, we're entirely focused on the CPI. And of course, today's FOMC, they reiterated that mandate by saying, yes, we see the CPI has improved and the PCE deflator is likely improved uh, as well, but we're not yet convinced that represents the end of consumer price pressures. Um, thinking back to the, uh, to the mistakes of the 1970s era Fed under Arthur Burns, Powell has said repeatedly he he wants to make sure that consumer price pressures are gone before the Fed actually does anything else. And what the markets are saying is those consumer price pressures Jay Powell is worried about, they're already gone and they've been gone since June. And that what happens is that the because the consumer price pressures disappear because the economy runs headlong into recession. At some point, that's going to pull the Fed out of its sole inflation focused mandate back to back into at least paying attention to the unemployment rate which 
I don't know if we can put a number on it, but if we start seeing the unemployment rate tick up at a pretty alarming acceleration, that would certainly get Jay Powell's attention. So the positive scenario is that the Fed has done its job, assuming you believe the rate hikes are the reason for it. And therefore, the rest of next this year and into next year will be the Fed enjoying the fruits of its labor as the consumer prices fall down to back toward their, uh, their uh, target rate. But the real concern is the Fed is completely wrong about that, which, by the way, happens to be the usual cyclical historical pattern. We went yeah. through this in 2019. We went through this in 2007, 2000, 1990. Pretty much every recession out there, the Fed is more worried about inflation until reality smacks them over the head and they realize, uh-oh, we've messed up on unemployment. So Makarov was saying that, you know, they, the, the Fed has to kind of do something and wait a long period of time to see what that something did, maybe 18 months even. So they can't preempt what the result will be. And so they're kind of, from that explanation, they're kind of doomed to always overshoot in whatever direction they go, right? They're always reactive because you're exactly right. They're always looking backward. They're looking at the data that, that already come in and, you know, something like consumer prices, there's there's a lag to that, too. So they're trying to predict what maybe policies are doing and what the economic data is telling them. But they're always reacting to things that have already happened, whereas the markets are looking ahead at the probabilities of things that are going to happen. And if the market pr looks at the the uh, diminishing consumer price pressures in the U.S., and this is not just the U.S. market. I mean, you look at the unprecedented inversion in Germany. It's This is a global issue here. And the markets are looking ahead at all the various consumer price numbers, economic data, reality on the ground that we don't see in the data just yet. There has been a material degradation in curves really since November started, which suggests that we may have hit another another accelerated downturn that isn't even anywhere close to the data yet. So the Fed's looking behind and thinking we got some time before we see anything happen in the data where the markets are worried that things are happening right now as we speak that will show up in the data in the near term and then the Fed will have to pay attention to it. And I think that's where that disconnect comes from. Historically speaking, you're exactly right. There's always that lag effect that the Fed is looking behind, markets are looking ahead, and eventually what markets are looking ahead for, the Fed has to consider because that's really where we end up going. Okay, so they have to wait for claims to explode, for non-farm payrolls to be negative. They have to wait to see basically a massacre take place in the jobs market to say, okay, 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 we need to drop maybe 50 or even 100 basis points and start going down that path, right? Basically, people have to feel some pain for this to change, right? Yeah, it's almost like they have to be mugged by reality. It's not like, you know, a little <laughs> bit of a tick up in jobless claims or, you know, continued claims or the, the establishment survey softens a little bit more to maybe 100,000 or so. That will not be enough for the Fed. They, they, they have, it has to be absolutely perfectly clear. You go back to the last time, for example, the Fed talked about in late 2007 market inversions that were about similar to where we are now. And they said, we can't figure out why the market is so inverted. It, it, we don't see it in the data. We're not seeing what the market is seeing. And of course, what happened was the Great Recession. And even as the Great Recession developed, up until really July and August of 2008, the Fed was convinced there wouldn't be any recession at all until it just fell in on them. So it's not unusual to see the Fed thinking one thing and sticking with that premise until it absolutely, completely, utterly falls apart. Whereas the market says, we have contacts on the ground that the data, you maybe you can't see it in the data yet, but we can see it from all our contacts because the people who are trading in Euro dollar futures and US treasuries and German bonds and all these things, they're the ones who have commercial contacts in the real economy, in the marketplace, and they're, they're trading on what they know that you don't. So if they're hedging so severely that they're buying German 30-year bonds that are well below the current MRO of the ECB, let alone tomorrow's 50 basis point rate hike, they're telling you they're afraid of something. They're afraid of something that you probably can't see, nor can the ECB or the Fed. And that's really the issue here is when did those two things collide? When did it, 
or is is will this be the first time ever that the market is wrong about it and that's really v quite a few different scenarios there so we might bring you in sometime in the middle of next year to talk about what happened with this deflation what's all what's all this deflation about uh most likely right so as a result of all this QE, uh, free money, loose fiscal policy for a long time, is the banking system broken? You had, um, you had said something about this. Uh, you, I think, uh, just recently, I, I heard you talk about the banking system and how it's operating. Can you give us your thoughts on the health of the banking system being on this Fed crack for the last whatever 12, 15 years or whatever it is? Yeah, it's actually, it hasn't been on, it had, you know, it's been a horrible 15 years for banks. And I think that's contrary to popular perception. You look at balance sheets, they've actually declined on on, on a uh, relative basis. And even on an absolute basis, banks have been cutting back for years. Uh, there was a bit of a spike up in 2020 with the CARES Act and everything in the U.S. But by and large, what they've done this year is kind of eye-opening too, especially credit that's coming from outside the U.S., dollar providers and credit providers offshore They've been cutting back on their balance sheet massively. Uh, they've been de-risking all year, which is consistent with what we're seeing in the marketplace. If we're seeing all of these curves inverted, we would expect that dollar providers and credit providers would be de-risking. I think the Z1 data told, it showed us the, for, up to the third quarter that the amount of credit supplied from the rest of the world to the U.S. shrunk by 5%. Now, some of that is market value. It's not all flows. But it tells you in no uncertain terms that as far as the banking system is concerned, this year has been a year to de-risk, to get out of all these risky activities, including the market looks at treasuries and, and the certain segments of the marketplace have been selling treasuries because they, they're afraid of the uh, rate hikes, further rate hikes from Jay Powell. But they're not doing, as they sell those treasuries, they're not replacing those assets with anything. They're not replacing that lost value with anything which means they're cutting back on a whole bunch of activities, which, again, consistent with what we see in the, the economy as well as these market curves. Very interesting. I, I have a question for Jeff. <clears throat> uh, first, Jeff, I want to say thanks so much. I love your podcast. Uh, I was actually a, a Euro dollar trader uh, all through 2005 to 2012, and I never really understood what I was trading until I listened to your podcast. So thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh my, that's awesome my, man. That's I, I kid you not man <laughs> i kid you not but uh my question is if do you think there's any anything else that powell could be doing right now to avoid a worse outcome or is is he really doing the best that he can with what he has well yeah i mean first of all we have to have a little tiny bit of sympathy for his job because he's been put he put himself, but he's been put in an impossible situation, right? I mean, he's had political pressure all year from people saying, do something about inflation, do something about inflation. And Powell, somewhat to his credit, initially said, this inflation isn't our problem. We didn't do this. This is a supply shock. There's nothing we can do to get oil out of the ground. We can't get containers back to China. That's not our problem. So in one sense, he's in an impossible situation where they have to appear to be doing something about consumer prices because everybody in the world has been breathing down their neck for somewhat of a good reason. So in one sense, he's maybe just screwed. His head is in a noose. And there's really not much he could do about it. I think the, the where it really come, it becomes an issue is what does the downside of the consumer, the supply shock of the last year, does it necessarily have to become what some of these darker scenarios are projecting? Um, he could look at the consumer price situation and say, politics be damned. Uh, we see consumer prices falling. We see what markets are saying. And we're going to be a little bit more careful about everything, if not become a little bit more friendly to the marketplace, because, you know, the, the levels, the extreme positions here suggest a lot of really bad scenarios. <laughs> so as far as Powell goes, by and large, I mean, he's put in a very, very difficult situation to begin with. But he could say, look, we look at the CPI report and it's clearly coming down. We think that it's coming down for a lot of lot of reasons, including that the economy has a substantially weakened, even if we don't see it in the data yet. And he could be proactive for once. Instead of always reacting to the markets or reacting to the data in the economy, he could say, we know where this is going to go because history tells us. 
supply shocks almost always end in nasty types of recession, we're going to get ahead of the curve here and say, we're expecting something like that. And we're going to do our damn best to try to, to, to limit the pain and the downside. But no, your Fed is saying we're, we're sticking with inflation until the CPI goes to zero or something else, <laughs> or something else changes their mind. So Jeff, the, Fed is always supposed to be outside of, pol pol of political pressure, right? And do you think that it's just they're, they're, the tools that they're using in their approach is just antiquated, right? They need some kind of fresh approach to everything? Well, part of the problem is they're not connected to the monetary system. And that's really what it comes down. Why are they always look? Why are they looking at the unemployment rate or the CPI or some of these monetary ag or some of these economic aggregates? when inflation is really a simple equation. Is there too much money? Is there not too much money? And I know everybody says the Fed prints money. They've made too much money. That's just, we don't have time to get into the details here. There's a, a, <laughs> there are a lot of podcast episodes about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's, a, there's a whole rabbit hole there. But, but, you know, that's why the Fed has to depend on the unemployment rate or the CPI because it can't answer that question, which is really what you, going along with what your question is. That's their entire worldview is outdated it's antiquated it's in, it's 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 uh it's inappropriate for the situation and so one sense they're starting behind the eight ball anyway because what the monetary tools that they've been given are for an era that doesn't actually exist anymore and so they're essentially trying to do the best they can with what they have though that's that's a little bit uh, there's a little bit of an argument and debate there too but again we can have a little bit of sympathy for jay powell's plight because Yes, they're supposed to be politically independent, but have they ever really been? Um, I'm not really sure that's ever been the case. And this year in particular, the amount of political pressure has been probably amplified a hundredfold because of how angry people became with the, the consumer price situation and how angry they, be, they became about the Fed using the word transitory, even though it's proving to be the correct, <laughs> the, the, the correct scenario. That's actually what happened. It's just that most people don't like waiting a year and a half for transitory to become transitory. Well, to find transitory, right? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's a term of art. There's no science here. True. Thank you. That question I had for you, Jeff, is how do you think institutions will position investors uh, this, this coming year? Do you have any ideas about that? How, you know, you're managing, you know, a couple billion dollars. What, what, do, you, what do you do with it? going into 2023, you have to perform, or at least you have to protect assets. What's What are some of the plays that we may see? Well, I think we're already seeing some of those play out. I mean, the heavily inverted curve is really demand for duration, which seem, again, it, initially it seems absolutely crazy with the Fed hiking rates, unless you're pretty confident that the rate hikes are at least coming to an end, and maybe there's some upside with duration. So I think the de-risking in the banking system is probably the leading edge of de-risking industry-wide. And, you know, his, history shows that in these types of situations, which, I mean, there's nothing really unique about it, um, that duration tends to pay off pretty well in that, in that kind of scenario. So that's one reason why these curves are so inverted is that uh, managers, hedgers, institutions, everybody else is preparing for a situation where we finally see what all the fuss has been about and whether or not this consumer prices really were transitory and if the downside really is into a nasty recession or something like that. Hmm. Interesting. So I'm not going to hit you with this question yet. We're going to run through and just get you uh, some questions here from the audience. If we avoid a recession and the yield curve steepens, wouldn't that still be a headwind for equities, especially growth stocks due to a higher long-term discount rate? It, it, in a ceteris paribus, all else equal world, yeah, you would think that. But if, if the, we avoid a recession, the yield curve steepens, that would actually be a positive signal because it would mean economic opportunities have increased. So the idea is that you have more economic opportunities, more nominal opportunities to offset the higher discount rate, which is sort of the Goldilocks scenario we've been looking for for 15 years and just it never happens. So yield curve steepening, I think, would be a positive sign if it's the right kind of steepening. We have to make sure it's not the bad kind of steepening, where which is where short-term rates fall faster than long-term rates, which is associated with the recession. 
You always see the yield curve steepen into the early parts of recession for that reason. So if the yield curve is steepening for the good reasons, I think that more than offsets higher discount rates. Okay. We have Raman Weimer here says M2 money supply doesn't get looked at enough. What's your opinion on that? I don't think you should look at M2 money supply at all. It, it <laughs> needs to be thrown in the ash bin of history because it's, M2 money supply is only domestic depository forms of money. It has no, does not take, doesn't take into account any of the more exotic forms of money that are really out there. So whether it be repo, whether it be global euro dollar, the 80 trillion in currency swaps that the BIS made such a fuss about last week, that doesn't get, that doesn't include it in any of the M aggregates, yet it is every bit of money, useful money in debt as anything that's in M2. So if you're looking at M2, you're only looking at a small sub-segment of just domestic depository money, and you're missing out on everything else. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions that we can hit you with regarding this. So I have one of my own that we're actually going to pop into every guest's um repertoire at the end here and i'm going to ask you what are three things you want to do better or more of in 2023 because this whole show is going to be about closing out the year a better 2023 not exactly uh new year resolution stuff but this could Close be enough. personal or professionally <laughs> <laughs> i mean this could be personal or professional it gives us insight into your you personally but uh whatever you whatever you choose what are three things you want you as an individual want to do better coming into 2023 well right off the bat i want to be a better communicator because you know as my my background is mostly about research and you think well if i do the research i do the data i do the knowledge you do the crunching and everything else that should be good enough but what you find is that if you can't effectively communicate what you're seeing and what you're saying to people it doesn't really matter. It's sort of a wasted effort. So I'm always trying to improve through the podcast, through writing, through everything else, including these 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 types of, of chats and uh, situations like this. Try to be a more effective communicator about things like M2. Why we shouldn't look at M2? Um, some of the you know another thing I always want to prove upon is getting a better data set because the euro dollar system, as I was alluding to, so much of it is hidden. So if I can get more information, more data set, talk to more people who do these kinds of things, uh, maybe don't know what they're doing, like uh, like uh, John was saying, but <laughs> get a, a better sense of data, a better sense of information that they can then communicate better to people and let them know what I think is going on, uh, so that they can have a good idea of what they what what I think reality actually is turning out to be. Those are two things, Jeff. Oh, we need a third one. <laughs> <laughs> a third one. Oh, that's that's well, you difficult. made you made this move from Alhambra to Atlas. Uh, you know, we, we don't need to get into the motives behind that, but how is this different for you? What do you there you're going after something by making this move? What is that? Yeah, I wanted to partner first of all with a fellow by the name of Steven Van Meter who's a guy that we actually, we were very, sim, sim, uh, we were very sympathetic viewpoints and we think a lot alike. So that was partnering with him, but uh, really it was, it was being able to do more independent research with, uh, without the constraints of always being attached to a registered investment advisory firm, which can, ha can, can have some benefits, but also some issues there too. So as far as that, continuing this independent research project called Eurodollar University, which hopefully builds upon those other two that I said before, more information, a deeper penetration into the behind the scenes stuff, as well as, again, being able to be a much better communicator in every single medium that we have. And I think that's one of the positives about the era that we're living in is that we have, we have so many different platforms that are available for people like myself, who is just an independent to be able to speak to a wider audience, which is something that, you know, up until recently, we, we just never had. I mean, if you wanted to speak to a wider off audience, you had to go through these mainstream gatekeepers in the mainstream media who were totally dismissive of anything that sounded remotely like it was outside of the mainstream thinking. So being able to, to leverage these, uh, not just social media, but various 
various mediums and, and platforms has been a has been a real benefit to people like myself who are always looking to do things independently. Very cool. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jeff, for for getting on here. I, I don't see any more questions. So I'm going to invite the audience once again to go to the link shown here to really, you know, I've been a trader for 22 years. I have a minor in economics and I didn't even scratch the surface with that minor. <laughs> once, once I started listening to Jeff um, and I actually came across you uh, as a guest on the macro, what is that show with macro Eric voices. voices? Yeah, macro with Eric. Voices. Yeah, <laughs> we had Eric, Eric on Townsend. a while ago. Yeah, I, I heard what you said and I was like, Man, I didn't understand a thing this guy said, so I'm just going to go follow See, him that's what I'm saying. Got to get better at explaining so that people can understand these things. I think you're trying to explain a very complex system. I mean, you have euro dollars, then you have the U.S. Treasury, then, you know, euro dollar yield curve versus U.S. yield curve versus what the Fed is doing versus the fiscal uh, picture what those politicians on the hill are dumping on the economy versus it's a uh, you know it's it's a, a brave uh, undertaking and I think you'll probably pull it off but there's so much that people don't know that I didn't know even coming into the market and listening to the news all day and trading I had no idea I didn't even know there was a euro <laughs> euro dollar yield curve I had no idea I didn't know those there was one kept offshore, um, but um, but I really appreciate it, and I want to encourage everybody to go listen and subscribe to the podcast. Again, you have the link in the uh, live chat here. Um, add it and set it to notify you once a new episode drops. That's what I do, and I listen to it, listen to it again, or don't listen to it again. Jeff is very good about repeating the same <laughs> points and what's important and get, hitting it from many different angles. And of course, uh, Jeff drops a lot of information through Twitter that link to his blog. And really, by the time you listen to Jeff for about a year or so, you, you're ready for your PhD in <laughs> macroeconomics, <laughs> really. So that that's twitter.com forward slash Jeff Snyder underscore A. I P please do that. Jeff, I want to thank you for coming on. I wish you a fantastic <laughs> holiday season and a great break. And, uh, 2023, uh, hopefully is the year where you really reach your potential with your communication, uh, communication initiative and then spreading the word about how the fed doesn't do anything except tell us what it's going to do, but never does it. <laughs> So you just you just summed up everything in a single sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. We appreciate it. Always a having pleasure, you. guys. Take care. Cheers. Thanks, Jeff. Take Thank care. you, Jeff. Thanks. Okay. Wow. So uh, Jeff uh, on point there with uh, with uh, what we asked with these questions. Uh, any thoughts, you guys? Uh, you know, do, do you both, I know Jeff, you said, uh, John, you said you uh, follow the podcast. What about you, Brian? Are you? Uh... You know, I think um, everything to his point, the communication part isn't really all his fault. It's a, it's a fire hose when you're trying to take in that entire subject. And there's so many, it, it's so vast and you're trying to take everything in and it's just, you have to hear it again and again and again. And I think you, begin to absorb pieces of it. The more you listen to it, the more you absorb and the more you get comfortable with. So, you know, to me, I'm a, I'm a day trader, but you know, we have to keep our eye on, on the bigger picture, of course. And so when I, I might not take in, I might not absorb everything he has to offer in a podcast, but I think it adds layers to what I have to do every day. So I'm just more, I'm just better prepared the more I listen to his stuff. A question to both of you. How do you separate the macro long-term stuff from day trading? How how do you make sure that you're 
view on what you have to do today isn't painted by this, oh my God, Euro dollar curve is inverted. The world's coming to an end type of stuff. How do you, how do you separate those two? Because many people just kind of don't even bother listening to this stuff. They don't want to hear it. They just want to trade what's in front of them or scalp the markets or whatever. How do you guys manage this information? John, why don't you go first? Well, I, I don't use any of it to make a trading decision, not, none of it to execute off of. But I will at times kind of use it to, to color my plans. Like, uh, for example, like right now, like, you know, the S&Ps are, are make, has been making lower lows all year long. You know, the high of the year was January 4th and, and our low was just a, just a few weeks ago. So, I mean, we're making lower lows and lower highs all year. And that's, you know, part of the macro picture. So when we kind of get to inflection points in the market, I'll sort of default to a more bearish view because that's the larger theme. But really in day-to-day -day trading decisions, it's just kind of that, it's sort of the shadow that hangs over it. But I'm not, uh, I'm not making execution decisions based on that. But it will sort of, you know, color my my bigger picture plans or especially like my plans for the week like you guys see I, I generally look at the weekly time frame a whole lot and uh to sort of you know provide a scaffolding for what i expect each day and so it'll factor into that when i'm looking at the weekly time frame but um in terms of whether or not we get like a gap to settle trade like i'm not i'm not thinking about macro stuff <laughs> um do you generally keep your hands off on these big macro events like CPI yesterday, Fed today, or do you just wait for things to settle down enough to, to then trade the same setup, same plan, same process? Or do you just say, hey, it's going to be kind of nutsy today. I'm just going to stay off of it. It really it depends. It depends a whole lot. It, it can it's, it can be very subjective based on things like how well I'm trading and whatnot. Because when you trade after a number, I mean, you know, I've traded after numbers most of my career. But you, you really have to be very on. You have to be willing to take losses. You have to trade smaller. So, you know, today after the FOMC, I didn't. I, I put on one one trade as well after the number, so I didn't trade it so much. Um, CPI, I, I can't actually remember now. I might have traded once. But for me, it, a lot, it'll depend a lot on just how, how well I'm vibing with the market in that moment. And it's never wrong for me to not trade, a, you know, a number because it can be really volatile. You can rack up stops really, even if you're, you have the right idea. So from it's just it's very it's very dependent on 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 how I how in tune I am with the market at that time, or if I'm expecting something, but it's never wrong for me to not trade it because it can, you know, higher higher reward, higher risk, you know. So it's it's never wrong to not get involved after a number, you know. I mean, the S and P after the FOMC, like if you're used to using a four point stop or whatnot, like you're, you're just a sitting duck if you traded it shortly after the number. So it's just better to sit out, you know, Yeah, if that's the case. Brian, uh, Brian, what, what's on both, uh, on both counts? Um, how do you make sure that the big picture doesn't paint your plan for today? And how do you deal with these big events, these macro based events? Sure. So, <clears throat> I think the big macro stuff is just it kind of it's a top down analysis. Right. And I start it underpins that top down. It starts. Where are we at on the on the global macro stage? Um, and how does that factor into where we are on a on a weekly basis, on a daily basis? And, you know, I see where I develop a lot of levels in the market and I see, you know, what the market did yesterday, what it did overnight and you know, is it, is it triangly balance? And, and if it is, where's it going? And that's, you know, so it's just kind of an underpinning. The macro stuff is an underpinning of right now. I think I've said for a while, I think we're stuck in a big balance area. And, you know, I, I anticipated the Fed would come out with 50 basis points today. And if they did that, we're not leaving balance. And that's pretty much where we are. 
And until the market does something to change that, you know, that that macro picture still remains the same. To clarify, uh, Brian is uh, is is focused on the the RTY, yeah. the Russell uh, 2000 futures. Uh, John uh, is the ES, um, the S&P 500 futures, uh, the minis. Uh, very cool. I think it's time we bring on Brian. I'm not sure if Brian's still here. Let's see if he is. Brian, are you with us? <coughs> yes, I am. Hey, Brian. How are you? Doing well. That was uh, pretty interesting. I didn't I didn't hear the whole thing, but man, uh, that uh, was Jim there, a smart dude. Yeah. He's uh, he's definitely uh, he definitely knows what he's doing on that end. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to dive right in here. Technical analysis. This is your thing. And uh, and the title here is uh, dropping anchors. We'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, just a quick introduction of who Brian Shannon is uh, known as Alpha Trends Online. Uh, trader, author, and creator of the Anchored View app, at least uh, the Anchored View app. I've never heard of such a thing until I met Brian here in Chicago. Uh, Brian is out of uh, Colorado, and he was here recording a show for uh, Anthony Crudelli, and we happened to be at the same show, and we talked about Anchored View apps. Uh, I want to make sure that you follow uh, Brian he has a very large following already, but uh, go to twitter.com forward slash alpha trends. And uh, of course, hit his website, alphatrends.net. Uh, you've got how many books now? I, I, I wrote one book in 2008 and I just finished another one. So I am not a natural writer. This this book on the anchored VWAP has taken me really about five years to do so it's <laughs> it's it's a love hate thing it's i love that it's done i hated every moment of it <laughs> wow very cool and let's get into it so yeah. the first thing i wanted to kind of touch base on and i'd love to have you positioned a little bit better and i don't know if i can do it correctly here i guess this is best we'll put you on top uh, you say only price pays. This is actually a tagline that you have on your Twitter profile. What what does that mean to you? What 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 are we supposed to take from that? Only price pays. Good question. I mean, it's something that I think is probably pretty intuitive to most traders. You know, uh, Brian and John were just alluding to that. That you know, and, and, and even you, more. You know, the yield, the the euro dollar curve is inverted. I didn't even know there was a, you know, like you said, you didn't even know there was a, a yield curve for it, for that, if I understood correctly. The point is, there's a lot of information in the market, and it's easy to get distracted by seasonality. You know, we're in this bullish seasonal time of year and the Christmas rally and, you know, the presidential cycle and all this stuff. And, you know, what's the Fed doing? And at the end of the day, you know, we can have our opinions of the news. But the only thing that matters is price. You know, that's that's how we live and die as traders. Only price pays. It's good to be aware that the Fed is, you know, is is due to, you know, they're going to speak at this time. The CPI is due, you know, yesterday morning at 630 my time local. Um, so, you know, we have to be aware of those things. But if I start to think, well, the CPI should be this and the market's stupid for doing that. And I start trading what I think, you know, that I'm smarter than the market. I'm dead. It's it's about price action. And I kind of, you know, started saying that about a dozen years ago to remind myself more than anything. Um, you know, I was kind of talking to myself that don't don't fall for that crap. Don't try to interpret the earnings report or the jobs report or whatever. Just focus on price action. So to you, price says it all. You don't need to know more than what price is showing you. And that's what you need to follow because the only way we make money is price changes. Uh, so that's that's the philosophy behind that. So yeah. jumping into the technical side of things, what is your favorite way of tracking price? Now, you know, you wrote a book, you know, a thing or two about technical analysis. Uh, uh, what, what is your favorite way of kind of keeping track of how the the, the price action is moving along? 
Well, that trade such a, that's not, that that question is such a setup, Morad. Right? We know that uh, it's the anchored volume weighted average price. The you know the anchor part is where you start your measurement from. So, for instance, you know as soon as Federal Reserve you know chairman spoke today, and you know we had the uh, the initial uh, uh, you know sell off. I placed an anchor directly on that candle. I started doing it on a 30 second chart. I didn't trade off this 30 second chart. I was, you know, kind of doing it to say, okay, here's how, here's the truth since that event. This tells us who's in control, buyers or sellers. I can listen to 10,000 different opinions of what it means and know where the Fed fund futures rate are doing this or this, you know, great economist said that. Or I can look at price action and say, you know, for those first 15 minutes or so, it rallied up to that volume weighted average price anchored to the moment and sold off each time. So, you know, the anchored volume weighted average price tells us the absolute truth of who's in control from any point that we set that anchor from. So it could be on a 30 second chart. Uh, You know, just the other day, uh, two days ago, um, when we hit this high, I guess actually yesterday, we hit the high in the uh, SPY and it hit almost precisely on the year to date anchored volume weighted average price. <laughs> so it, you know, these, these numbers are just uncanny. Yesterday, we bounced from the month to date volume weighted average price uh, in, this, in the S&P and the NASDAQ. I mean, they were almost that. perfect yeah. intraday. So, I mean, it, it's just there's a lot of programs, a lot of trades. It used to be just a benchmark for execution, but now it's an actual uh, 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 analysis tool. That to me again tells the truth of supply and demand from any point. So just to be clear, VWAP stands for volume weighted average price. Yes. It is not dependent on time. It is not dependent on the bar type or the the periodicity of a bar. It is simply looking for the average price once you factor in the volume traded at each price. So it's representing price and volume. And other than the volume profile and maybe, um, what is that uh, a chart called? Trend spiders or spider trends or something. There aren't that mm-hmm. many tools that actually combine those two pieces together. You could use uh, uh, you know, 5,000 volume bars or whatever, right. but this is, this is not doing that. This is another tool that I'm, paying a close attention to now that that looks the same no matter what your periodicity is and i think that's very important so so you know look look that up make sure you understand what the vwap is why do you feel this gives you uh, an edge over a regular vwap you know like uh, most charting packages have a vwap and it starts at the beginning of the day and it just kind of follows along why is anchoring it to a particular event going to treat um, treat the price action any differently? The volume weighted average price started out in 1988 as a benchmark for execution. An in, in, in institution wanted to know, you know, I, I sent in an order to Goldman Sachs to buy 500,000 shares of Intel. And how do I know if I got a good price for that? What's a fair price? Well, the volume weighted average price is the measurement of every single trade. So, you know, it's really a tick data is the absolute truth in that. That's the, you know, the most uh, accurate number for, for, you know, most trading. You don't need a tick tick data. It just takes up too much resource on your chart and that sort of thing. But um, what it does is the volume weighted average price tells you for one day, you know, and it's, it's cumulative. As you said, it's not peri- periodic. It's cumulative from the very beginning of whatever market you're trading. So if I'm looking at equities at 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. close. Well, as the day progresses, the the rate of the volume weighted average price changes. So it looks like a regular, you know, time-based moving average, uh, but it's cumulative from that first point. So the most weighting goes to where the heaviest volume is. So you start out at the beginning of the day, it's really responsive and it starts to slow down with volume throughout the day. And then we start to see it, you know, evolve as a battleground of support and resistance. Well, that's the traditional view app is one day. The anchored view app I can set from the Fed at 2 p.m. I can set from the 6.30 a.m. CPI report. 
So it allows me to start from rather than, you know, let's say traditional moving averages, I might have a, you know, 20 day moving average. Well, what's the significance of 20 days other than the fact that a lot of traders use it. So, you know, we need to watch it because it's become uh, a level that people stop selling as it pulls back to people start buying. So it's the psychology of those traditional moving averages that makes them important. And it's also the same with the anchored VWAP, but it's from the beginning of the week, from the beginning of the month. And you have to think about how portfolio managers uh, in, in the beginning of the year and how portfolio managers get paid and how they make their decisions. They're not trying to be super timers. Now, you can argue that, you know, no institution, they're, they're just as different as individual traders. You're going to have scalpers in the institutional arena that will, you know, flip 500 contracts at a time for a point that is, you know, out there. Then you have Warren Buffett at the other end of the spectrum. So there's all kinds of, you know, time frames and personalities. But the anchored VWAP allows us to say from the beginning of the week, from the beginning of the month, these portfolio managers will say, listen, we're too heavy in this area. Let's trim it over the next month. And they'll set an order for over the course of the month to sell X number of shares. If they're taking their position from 5% down to 3%, well, then they say, okay, well, the average daily, you know, that means we need to sell 5 million shares. The average daily volume is 500,000 shares. That means we need to, you know, 20 days in a month, we need to sell 250,000 shares per day. Well, how do we do that? Well, 2% of the average daily volume is done in the first five minutes of each day. So they're going to set it with time slices. And I'm getting a little bit deep in the woods here. Um, but the point is it kind of self-reinforces. So they want to do just, you know, it's basically, they call it the price a naive trader could expect to, to receive. That is, you know, the, the big institution who can't time necessarily the sale of two and a half million shares the way I can time, you know, 5,000 shares that I want to buy or sell. It's much easier for me. Um, and it's evolved as a, you know, it's become a level of support and resistance and even more so self-reinforcing like the traditional moving averages, because it's now on countless, uh, a dozen or more trading platforms like TC2000, TreadSpider, uh, um, uh, you know, TradingView, uh, and a bunch of other ones. So a lot more people have the tool available to them and they look at it and say, hey, that's the third time it bounced off of that volume weighted average price. Let's take a look and see what's there. So it's uh, I kind of went on a little bit too long, perhaps more, Ed, but uh, no, I, it's it's good. I mean, I threw it on here. The, the Fed announcement came in. It's this uh, gray line that I have on my chart here. The Fed came out right in here. Uh, the the point at which the Fed uh, announced is around 40, 80 in the ES. This is the ES March contract. And uh, I'm, I, you know, I was tracking how the market is treating it as it moved along. This is a point figure one, one by yeah. eight tick chart. But let me throw it back at you, uh, Brian. Just one more question here, a couple more questions before we get into some charts, because I'm really interested in looking at your charts and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Can you share some examples of how you set the, the, uh, the anchored VWAP? Uh, you know, there's, there's a question here, um, right here. It says, where do you set the anchor on non news events? There's also, uh, there's also another one that's, that's asking, do you, what do you anchor to if there's not big events or is the anchored view app only useful for macro events? Like we want to hit on that a little bit with this question. What? What uh, what are some examples just without the charts at the moment sure. that would trigger uh, putting on an anchored VWAP? Well, so I'm I'm a swing trader primarily. I I've put on some examples uh, for you know this chart because I I think your audience here is more uh, you know futures traders type you know short term stuff. So my as a swing trader, what I look at is a, a trending stock. So. I'll look at a stock and, you know, we have those natural waves of higher highs and higher lows or lower highs and lower lows. So I will anchor from those swing highs and swing lows. So, you know, we don't know. Let's say we have a stock in an uptrend. It pulls back three days 
And then it starts to, you know, on the first day of the pullback, it becomes obvious that that high, you know, we rallied five days, it starts to pull back. So I'll put a, a, I'll anchor to the peak of that five day rally. Now, if the stock turns back around midday and continues higher, fine. But I want to start to measure the psychology from the turning points. So if over the next two days we continue to see lower highs and lower lows develop, well, day three, we might see a rally in the morning and it gaps up and runs right into that VWAP from the peak. And I see this happen all the time. That declining volume weighted average price from the peak, it acts as resistance. Boom, boom, boom. It sells off. It comes back down, takes a couple of days to flatten out, and it starts to, you know, starts to flatten out for a day and a half, two days. And there might have been an obvious little uh, low. Then we have a higher low. As soon as we get that next higher high, and I'm looking, I'm talking maybe on a 15 minute time frame. Uh, and the, the, when we get that first uh, higher high, and I'm not saying above the swing high, but after it's pulled back, gone sideways for a day and a half and then pops up over that short-term resistance, I'll set my anchor to the low point. And as we get up through the volume-weighted average price from the prior peak, it tells me the buyers have control from that peak that we saw four days ago. I know for fact that the buyers are in control because the average price is lower than where this stock is right now. It's factually correct to say that the on average, the person, the, you know, the, the people involved from that high, the longs, are in the money now. The flip side, of course, is there's always somebody on the other side of the trade, and they're short. So we know for a fact that the average short doesn't mean that the guy who you know nailed the top and got lucky, he might wait for that higher high to you know break out and tell him he's wrong, which is just stupid, anyways. But that's a different point. Um, we want to you know look at it and say we know for a fact that the buyers are in control. They're holding that volume weighted average price from that low that was made three days ago. They're back above that volume weighted average price from the high five, six days ago. The buyers are in control. That's in alignment with the longer term uptrend. So now I want to look at this stock and say, I want to be involved here and I want to set my stop underneath the most recent relevant higher low. So that's where my stop goes. So if we went sideways for a day and a half, it made that spike low. It came up, made a higher low. My stop goes under there. And then I'll just raise my stop up to it. We get the breakout three days later. I sell some into the breakout almost every single time, it, you know, to the breakout chasers. Um, so anyway, so it, it so does. We'll look at happen. examples of that, right? Uh, we'll we'll share charts yeah. here in a second. Yeah. I'm going to hit you with one more question, one more question, because I want to hit, uh, I want to get to the charts. Do you also anchor to fixed points like beginning of month, week, year, quarter, yeah. and so on? All of those. Not not quarter. I really don't do quarter, but uh, beginning of the week, I do um, month to date. I will also do um, so uh, week to date, month to date, year to date. Uh, I'm always interested in the prior days VWAP. You know, I call it the two-day VWAP, but you know, half you know, half hour into the day, it's not really a two-day anchored volume. It's one day plus 30 minutes. Um, so I want to see how the mood develops, especially you know, yesterday, the the this morning in the ES, in, the, in this morning we came up to the VWAP from the CPI just absolutely to the penny and came off it, you know, five six points immediately. And then we saw this afternoon when the rally came up off the Fed after it got up above that view app, it ran smack into the CPI high from yesterday. And that was the precise high. So we can take a look at that on a chart. So here's here's a um, uh, how do I change it? I, I just got to change my view so that I can uh, look at the chart and make sense of it. Uh, here we go. So. This is the CPI yesterday, and we're looking at a, that's a one minute chart. So let's go to five minutes. So as soon as the Fed, uh, I'm sorry, the CPI came out, we had that huge rally. We made a lower high, we made this low, then we made a lower low below the volume weighted average price from that event. Well, this morning we came up and it was perfect right here at 79 and a quarter, and we came down to 71. Um, and then it was just kind of a battleground. But later on, you know, we had just all that indecision in a quiet market. This is, we can go to a two minute chart now. This is what I was talking about. So this is the moment that the Fed reported. 
And uh, you can see that the rallies, you know, that initial big candle down, you know, was defended by the sellers each of these times. It tightened up a little bit, made this higher low and ran through it. And I mean, you cannot make that up more. Look at the tick there. That's the CPI from yesterday. That was the precise high. There was nothing that I'm aware of that would have told you to look to take some of your profits off, look to maybe short, you know, look down to the one minute time frame and say, you know, if it makes a one minute low, I'm going to short with a stop against that level. Um, so, you know, and this is the after hours stuff. Um, so, you know, there's there's just there's all kinds of ways to use it. And we can look at a stock yesterday, um, GFS. Here's one that that was, you know, worked great. Um here we go. So this is a 60. Let's do it on a 15 minute chart. This is kind of what I was talking about. So you've got this chart on a 15 minute time frame and I can anchor a view app to that peak right there. So that was that peak, uh, you know, like I said, probably about a week and a half ago. And then it came down. We kind of went sideways a little bit. This is the precise point right here. We knew for a fact that the buyers were in control. And it doesn't mean it was the perfect place to buy it, but that's where we knew for a fact. Then I'll look at it and say, what's the what's the low here? I'll put it right there. Uh, you know, I'll anchor right there. Um, and it took a little while. You know, I would have set that anchor probably around this area. So I'm not saying like that I would have anchored it here, although that was the, you know, the gap up. So I would have anchored it there yesterday. But I was long coming into yesterday, some of the stock. And as per my plan, you know, I was along down here at 63.75 ish, and my plan was, if it gaps up, I'm going to sell some to the breakout buyers who are chasing the stock above 68.70, and you know, the that was the smart thing to do. And if I'm in down here where the buyers I know for fact are in control, well, then of course I want to sell some to the breakout buyers because the stock just went from 63 to 69; it just ran 10 percent in a day and a half, I want to feed into that. I don't, in, so I'll sell a piece of it. I held a third and got stopped out of that. Um, where's my sheet? I forgot what price I got stopped out of. Uh, 65.43 was where I, I got stopped out of the balance. So, you know, there's one example. Um, so, so on that example, let's just, uh, because we're all technical traders here, you described, you know, the market coming down, putting in a swing bottom, coming back up, poking mm-hmm. through higher low. Can you just walk us through that so we understand what the setup is? So you've just one more time, just explain. Here's why I anchored here. Here's what the trade setup was. Here's where I triggered. Here's how I'm managing the trade. Sure. Let me do this. Can I share my other uh charting platform. I, I have futures on that one. And what I really want to share is my main equities one, which is, where's the right window? Let me find it. Here we go. Um, so this, this is, this is where I do the equities. So on GFS was the stock. So I will look at that and say, you know, on the daily time frame, you know, we, it broke some resistance here. We had this nice are rally. You, it pulled are back. You- Pull up. Oh, hang on. Let me pull this up here. Okay, cool. This okay. is what you wanted to show. Yeah. Um, I can't see. Uh, it's the TC two thousand. Yeah, that's the one. So, so here on a fifteen minute chart, the way I look at it is this is really important to me for swing trading as well. And this is a five day moving average. I've been working with this five day moving average for years, and I never trade against the direction of the five day moving average. So if that's trending lower for a swing trade, I don't want to get involved. But if it makes a higher high above the flat to rising five day moving average, that's where I want to get involved right here with my stop below the most recent relevant higher low. So that would have been right here for me. Other people might say, hey, I'm going to maybe put half my stop there. And that's the low that I want to protect against. But if I'm going to use one risk unit, I can do basically three times as many shares with this stop than I can with this stop. So as it rallies up, I sell some almost always the first day on daily R2. So I sold a third there. As it broke out to the new high, I sold a third there. 
And then I set my, I'm on that final third. I had my stop under this higher low and you know, that's, that's that. So the trade's over. So I sold one piece here, one piece here and one piece here. So basically for an average really of about the third point. Um, but you never know that last piece, you know, sometimes can just continue to do crazy things. Um, do you trail that last piece or what do you do with it? I, yeah, I trail it underneath the most recent relevant higher low. So I'm using the definition of trend. And in this case, I bought the higher high here with the stop under here, because this, this was the higher high above the flat to rising five day moving average. So I bought there. And then my first third, I take off because that now basically lowers my cost basis to down here. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a position of strength right from the start. As the stock moves, as it rallies like this the next day, I put my stop under here. As it makes this high, here's the most recent relevant higher low. Now, on this day, when I sold a third, I left my stop down there. I really probably should have said under here because this was a higher low and it was such a big sell off and the market was caving in. I decided I was going to give it the benefit of the doubt. But, you know, we can all go back to our trades and say we should have done this or should have done that. But um, yeah, that's, that, that's one. I can tell you a setup I like. Um, hey, Brian, like, before, before you leave, can I just ask a question? Do you ever use the, uh, the VWAP as, do you ever hide behind that as your trailing stop? Or is that just too far away? It's generally too far away. However, what I might do is say, you know, now, some people ask me, do you set a stop from where you enter? Uh, I'm sorry. An, an anchor, do you set an anchor from where you entered? Only if I think I entered properly, like right here. So you can see that, you know, if I set, if I set my anchor there, and I didn't even know it did this, it found buyers there, it defended it here, and then kind of broke down. So I don't generally do that. In this case, it happened to be that final third was in the same spot. I like to use the definition of trend because that to me, I, you know, I'm a trend trader. I, I want to find the stock in an uptrend on a daily time frame after it's pulled back and consolidated and renews that upward momentum. And then as long as it makes these higher lows, I want to set my stop under those. And as like I said, I should have set it there, but, uh, you know, I was busy doing other things. I guess I don't remember. I was complacent with it, figuring I'll just give that final third. Let's see what happens with it. Very cool. So just so I understand, the yellow line is a five-day, um, is it simple moving average? Or it is, is a it simple moving average. And I'll, I use that on the SPY a lot as well uh, for my intermediate term bias. And you can see we came right down to it today. This is the month to date anchored volume weighted average price where we bounced perfectly from it yesterday. So this is the week today, and this is from the CPI right here. Um, and I don't have it on this time frame, but right here you can see I have it from the Fed uh, today. So back to the five-day moving average, something really important is if you look at my daily chart, you'll see I don't have a five-day moving average there. It's only on my, intermediate, my, my intraday time frame. Mm -hmm. So... A lot of people will go, hey, Brian, I put, you know, I put moving average and I put five, but it doesn't look like yours because they just put a five period moving average. So with equities, because I'm mainly an equities trader, the market's open from 930 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's six and a half hours, 390 minutes. So over the course of five days, it's 1,950 minutes. So if I'm looking at a five, I'm sorry, at a 10 minute chart. To get that five-day moving average, you take 1,950 minutes and divide it by the time period. So this is, in fact, 195 uh, minute periods. If I go to the 30-minute time frame, there's 13 of those per day, 9.30 to 10, 10.30 to 11, et cetera. There's 13 of those. So 13 times 5, that's a 65-period moving average. That's the true five days. So if I had a five day on a daily chart for, you know, at 935 tomorrow morning, I'm really only looking at a four day moving yeah. average plus five minutes. Right. Right. Okay. So, 
for this, you have an intraday five day moving average. You're really using that as your primary filter, so to speak. The market needs to cross that, cross above that on a 15 minute, let's just say a 15 minute yeah. chart. Then you're looking for the pullback to a higher low and then you're triggering off of the last swing high and then you're selling into the momentum on that on that break so uh, some way yeah so so for instance you know like right here i didn't buy that higher high right there because to me that's extended it just rallied i always have to say where does it come from it just came from 393 to 398 it just rallied five points i'm not going to be the guy who buys it up one and a half percent that day I would have, you know, I was looking to buy this the next day, but I wanted to see it do this and then to buy right here, not to buy the pullback, but to buy strength after the pullback and then set my stop under there and then look to hold it if it does this until it breaks down. Um, anyways, that's, you know, the way I want them to happen. And we know we know what the market thinks about what we want. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to hit you up with some questions here. Um, here's one. Let me just uh, bring that in. So Zawi says, how do you find trending stocks or using filtered a filtered watch list? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I th this is something that uh, I'll give you the very short answer, which is I do it all manually. I don't set scans and tell the market what I want. Again, the market doesn't care what I want. So if I tell the market I want these types of stocks, then yeah, I'll get a pretty good result. And there's nothing wrong with scanners to narrow your universe. But I look each day at, you know, on the weekend, I look at about a thousand stocks on six different time frames, and I do it, you know, rather quickly. So I have a screen that might look like this. Uh, plus a couple other ones. So here's a weekly chart, a daily. Uh, that should be a, uh, that's not correct. That should be a 30 minute. Yeah, because that's a 65. And then a 10 minute. And then I'll have two other time frames. And I just am going through them like this, one at a time, you know, almost that quick because I'm, you know, I'm familiar with them. So INMD, here's a stock I like on the weekly time frame. It's starting to set up. It's it scared the people out. Now it's worn them out over the last year. So I look to the daily time frame and you can see it's being held back by the anchored VWAP from that peak. That's not a coincidence that it hit it perfect and sold off there three weeks ago. So now we've got the 20 day moving average, the 50 day. This orange is the anchored VWAP from the COVID low. That's still kind of you know a battleground for it. So then I look to the 60, 30 minute time frame. And then down to the 10 minute time frame to get it more clarity. This is what I consider a C list idea because it's not quite perfectly, you know, the none of them are perfectly set up, but, you know, I like SIG as well. SIG is, you know, same type of thing. They didn't scare you out, they'll wear you out. Rather than trying to buy some nonsense like PayPal, which they're still wearing people out, it hasn't shown any ability to recover and, uh, you know, move from there. So, I want to focus on these ones. I want to focus on a stock like if I'm an investor, which I'm not, Home Depot that's breaking out here. But I can still swing trade this stock. And I did. I owned it right. I, I got involved right here on Home Depot. Uh, and then I sold most of it into that. And then I just decided enough of it right there. Um, so those are the types of things I'm looking at. Um, so to me, it's, it's, it's about doing a lot of work. So I get my master list down to my weekly list, which is about 300. I go through those. I write them down on a sheet of paper. This is my short list for tomorrow. And, you know, and I put little checks mark to them. Then I set a bunch of alerts. And it's a lot of work, but it's work I love. Okay. Very cool. We have a couple more questions, which I may not be able to get to. Uh, well, actually, several of them, most of them you've already answered through these, mm -hmm. this detail. How are you determining, this is from Mr. Anderson, uh, how are you determining hold times on these swing trades? Are you actively managing, uh, have clear target points or trailing stop, waiting for trend reversal to determine a move is over? You partially answered this, but mm -hmm. do you have a, a time frame in mind for your trades when you go in? Or is it just based on the price action? Ideally, I want to hold two to three weeks. 
this market is not really allowing that. You know, the shorts, you know, you could say, well, why don't you just short this and hold it? Because you get these crazy, stupid gaps up that crush your soul mm -hmm. in your equity. Um, so on the long <laughs> side, you know, I want to hold them two to three weeks. The market's not letting me. So I'm working down to shorter term time frames and I'm taking that first third off much more aggressively. And to me, it's about the definition of trend. Like I said, it's it's not the market doesn't care that I want to sell it at 350. I'm not going to hang on to a price target. To me, price targets are kind of useless. I want to have an idea. So I, in my head, I have a risk reward that says, does it make sense to take this trade based on the, my perceived risk reward? But if I buy it here and it just, you know, it just caves in, I mean, I, I guess the screen's not up, but, you know, it's not up to me. It's up to the market. It's the, I'm, a, tr I'm trading for a trend on a short term time frame. So my way of doing it, what works best for me to hold as long as possible is to use the definition of trend, higher highs and higher lows for the time frame that I'm engaged on, which generally I'll do that on a 15 or 10 minute uh, time frame. Um, and those higher lows occur, you know, about three to six hours apart, typically. And that, that's the, you know, typically. Mm. Okay, very cool. Um, I want to leave you with this question, and I, I wish I could uh, block Jared's ears uh, during this uh, this question here, since he's on standby. But uh, what are we're asking everybody this as we lock up the year? What are three things you want to do better or more of in 2023? This could be a personal thing you want to get better at or something professional. Jeff kept it professional. And uh, let's see what you do. Okay. Um, you know, <laughs> last year I made the decision to um, cut alcohol out of my life. And I've Good gone for you. 12 awesome. and a half months of that. So I want to continue on the sober train. I haven't had a beer. I haven't smoked a joint, any of that stuff in 13 months. And you live in Colorado. That must be tough. <laughs> <laughs> We're all about the same age, so it gets easier. You know, been there, done that um, for a long time. Um I want to, you know, we're, we're at the age where health is, you know, we, we recognize our health more. So I want to continue to do anything and that's, that's alcohol as well, but in, anything to just may make sure that, you know, we see our parents getting older and having issues and try to put myself in a position. So when I'm older, I don't have those same issues or maybe not as severe, you know, physically breaking down mental acuity. Um, so I want to, I want to read more. I want to narrow my focus in the market. And if the market, you know, turns and we see that, you know, the, the more stocks are turning like Home Depot and uh, SIG and, and uh, you know, I keep forgetting the symbol because I traded it yesterday. It doesn't even matter anymore. Um, but, it, you know, to hold those stocks as long as the market allows me to hold my winners better. I think you mentioned, uh, you forgot to mention one of your favorites. I think you said PayPal's one of your favorite stocks. That's that, it. Yeah, that I right? love that. I keep averaging down. I've got, <laughs> I've got my cost average all the way down to 300. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Thanks so much. I want to remind uh, members of the audience here that uh, to, to go out and uh, if you have a Twitter account, go out and follow uh, Brian. Just a lot of good information. You can find him at twitter.com forward slash alpha trends. And of course, check out his website, alphatrends.net, and his book, which has actually, Brian, when I met him two years ago, he had a full head of curly hair. But since he's been working, <laughs> since he's been working on this book, uh, and it's taken him about five years, which will be launched in January, hopefully uh, uh, an Amazon bestseller. Um, he, he's lost all of his hair. That's how much effort he has put into um, put into this book. So check it out when it comes out. You'll probably find references to it on his Twitter as well as alphatrends.net. Thanks so much, Brian, for joining us today. Thanks. Hey, Emory. My ha hippocampus is very happy. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Thanks, Brian, for coming on. Cheers. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thank you.
Wow, that was that was very interesting. It's it's uh, it's you know Brian is one of these guys that just you you're you're drinking from a fire hose. And uh, what's cool about him is uh, is just how he openly shares what he's doing and across the board equities, uh, whether individual stocks or ETFs as well as futures. Uh, so it's very interesting to me because I'm a day trader and he's uh, operating at a different level. So I've gathered some insights today that I didn't have. So I really appreciate having him on. Just a fantastic guy. Um, and great, great aspirations for the next year. He's, uh, he's, he's really rocking it. So what did you guys think? Uh, uh, we're behind schedule here a little bit. Some, a few words on this last segment. Any thoughts? I'll tell you, I'm totally drinking the uh, Anchored VWAP Kool-Aid. <laughs> it's uh it's really fascinating i i have one anchored from the the covid 19 lows and uh from the all-time high as he does and i keep an eye on him for uh bigger picture stuff but lately i've been using it more the way that he describes with anchoring it to events and and it really it, i mean i posted those charts today i it, there is a reaction there's a clear reaction so i I'm interested. I want to read his book. Very good stuff. Very cool. Brian, any thoughts? Yeah. So, you know, I think we find it interesting because I think it's really connected to what we do with value. Totally. Profile. I mean, we could just, we can start drawing a, pro a profile from anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And start paying attention to, to what that profile gives us. And we do the same thing with respect to who's in control. Is it, is it daily paper traders? Is it an inter intermediate time frame? Is it the OTF? And, you know, we all have different levels based on who is in control. And that's kind of what he's looking at too, with, with respect to those anchored VWAPs. So I, I think it ties in nicely with what we do and it's, you know, it's another tool. Definitely. Very cool. So without further ado, I'm going to have uh, Jared here, one of my favorite people in the industry Jared, Hi, up, Morad? thanks for coming on, buddy. I really appreciate you uh, being here. Appreciate having you. Um, we're going to, he's coming at us from, uh, from uh, Pittsburgh, right? Uh, other side of Pennsylvania. So uh, near, near, near Philly, but near yeah, Philly, that's that place I mean. up in the East coast. Yeah. I, I know you're a key, a key stoner. Uh, so real quick uh, rundown and intro with Jared again, just one of these great guys to, to follow uh, has been, he's been working on some breakthrough stuff. Jared has an MS in counseling, psychology, licensed mental health counselor, mental game coach for golfers, poker players, and traders, professionals. And he's the author of three performance books. His uh, trading book is very, very uh, popular. Uh, he's, he's pioneered some, some stuff that we're going to talk about here a little bit. Again, I'm going to invite you. This is another person that you should be following twitter.com forward slash Jared Tendler. And of course his website, Jared Tendler, uh, .com. Sorry, forgot the, uh, .com <laughs> part. Uh, but you know, punch that into Google. I'll find it for you. Yeah. Um, so my SEO is working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, oh, these are popping in the wrong way. Sorry about that. I was going to surprise you with that question. Uh, so you're well known for, uh, for performance and mental, uh, mental coaching. Um, it is the end of 2022. Typically, what goes on during sessions with clients at this time of year? So you have these, you, you do a lot of coaching. A client comes in at this time of year. What, what should they expect from you, Jared? Yeah, I, I should say out of the gate, I, I like your very timely World Cup uh, headline here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Spanish uh, announcers in my head uh, as I'm reading that. Uh, yeah, so end of the year, right? I, I mean, clients that I've been working with for over a year, we are kind of looking at what our goals were from the start of the year and comparing kind of what actually happened, right? I mean, Goals are just estimates, right? They're estimates both of like what you think you're capable of. They're estimates of what you think you want in the future. You know, I think that's that sometimes can get a little squirrely for people. Like, you know, a poker player thinks he wants to be one of the best players in the world. But then when he sees how freaking hard it is or how much work is involved, they're like, 
you know, I'm actually fine just being at this level and, and enjoying it. Or traders doing the same thing. You think you want to be scaling up and, and taking on larger size, but you're not either, you're not even ready for it, let alone, are you sure that you even want, uh, you know, the, the, to be managing it? So yeah, a lot of it is, is making sure that there's a kind of a good assessment of what were our uh, thoughts, assumptions uh, from the start of the year. Uh, and then how does that compare with what actually happened? Um, there's a goals worksheet. I don't know if I can, if I can share my, my screen here. Yeah. Uh, you can hit the, uh, share button and yeah, share a window. It'll pop up here. I'll remove mine and add yours. All right. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. So this is, I'm trying to make it a little bigger. Um, this is a kind of the goals worksheet. Um, that I, I, I use with clients. Um, you know, you can see there's kind of three main categories. Top is the result goals. You know, effectively like the what do you want? Uh, for some, it's it's it can be kind of very process driven, like what you see here. Right, become confident in my trading and execute consistently according to my system. Right, so should be obvious. This is a fairly newer trader, uh, at least when when this uh, these goals were set. Um, you know, embrace mistakes as learning opportunities. So very kind of a process driven set of result goals but for a lot of more experienced traders right we're setting monetary p l goals we're setting uh maybe some metrics in terms of adherence to uh strategy right like you know you can create kind of grades for each of your trades and you want to set like kind of uh, execution based requirements for uh you know that being a, a, a result goal but whatever it is that you want to kind of set your mind to uh, the sec, the section right below that is, is why those goals matter. And, and this is important because you are going to be tested. If you're going to go after anything that's worthwhile, you're going to be tested along the way. And so understanding the kind of the why behind that or behind all of them is really important to kind of sustain, to stabilize motivation. Uh, and then we get into the process goals, which are kind of the, the yin to the yang of the result goals, right? Like process goals are determined based on, on what you think it's going to take to achieve those end outcomes. And, and so process goals, I think for a lot of traders end up becoming the thing that they are, are primarily focused on in the short term, right? You know, daily, weekly, sometimes monthly, like this is primarily how you are evaluating your own progress and your own uh, sense of accomplishment, uh, you know, day to day, right? If you're making money or losing money daily, um, it really ought not to move the needle emotionally, although we know that that's not the case. But, in, you know, I think from an optimal standpoint, uh, if you're evaluating yourself more in these process goals, knowing full well that it's a good plan, then they're going to lead you in the direction of those result goals, especially, you know, kind of P&L uh, based if you're if you're, um, you know, everything's kind of lined up. Uh, then in that bottom section, again, we're kind of also trying to be a bit uh thoughtful about what are the problems that are likely going to derail us as we attempt, you know, to go after this, right? And so this person talked about burnout, uh, impatience, you know, not being 100% every trading session. So there's there's a lot of variables that we're trying to consider. So at this time of year, we're kind of looking at this and and really, you know, reevaluating uh, how much progress has been made along all these dimensions. Now, for some clients, wait, we're reevaluating this on a quarterly basis. This doesn't have to be just yearly, right? Sometimes for uh, depending on, on where that trader is in their development, right? Newer traders, I think it's important to look at a smaller time frame, right? Sometimes monthly or quarterly, you know, more experienced traders, right? The institutional traders that I work with, you know, we're working at this yearly. Um, now, I would say that one of the more common mistakes, and maybe I'm kind of jumping here a little bit, but one of the more common mistakes is um, achieving <laughs> your result goals, uh, you know, that you set for a year and, and it's, you know, sort of six months in. Uh, this was a bigger issue for some of the institutional traders in 2020 when, I mean, like we're talking banner year within first five months of the year because of some of the, uh, you know, a lot of them were options traders who were, um, we'll say short. Uh, so uh, so to, they, you don't, you don't just say, well, go to, go to Tahiti and just hang out <laughs> for six months. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if you're, if you're, you know, the, the, like the NBA, you know, NFL players of the world, right. You've just won a championship. What do you want? Right. You want another championship. And that's, that's what this is. Right. So the problem for a lot of traders is that 
if you kind of lose sight of, of like that kind of next benchmark that you're aiming for, if it's just P and L driven after having great success, you know, it, it's, it's unlikely to like really drive you unless it is something that is deeply meaningful for you. Uh, so in that regard, we kind of try to bake in more process goals. And in that example, right, like, you know, overconfidence is, is a really big threat, both from a, a kind of macro perspective for them uh, in terms of, you know, just taking a little bit easier every day, not kind of working as hard, that preparation gets a little sloppy, you know, things kind of can slip if you don't kind of have the motivation lined up as you will. But then also from a, a, a day-to-day standpoint, in terms of your actual execution, you might hold trades longer than you should. You might try to press. You might try to enter, think you can kind of, uh, you know, fly uh, a particular trade that's really kind of outside of your um, uh, purview, right? Kind of main style. Or a... So point is like overconfidence is is kind of the silent killer. And, you know, ideally you'd be in a position where overconfidence is an option because your goals have been... Uh, achieves uh, already but bottom line is right we're, we're trying to look in the rearview mirror at the end of the year and and really take stock of what you've a- achieved what you haven't what skills you've developed which skills you want to now develop uh what mistakes and failures uh occurred and you know i think try to remove as much of the scar tissue as possible from <laughs> any of those hang-ups we don't want those things to kind of uh pile up year over year um and then we're trying to begin to brainstorm you know, what 2023 looks like. So most people go into the year without any, uh, without any goals at all. What are some key benefits to setting goals versus going into the year and just saying, I'll take whatever it gives me. So I think the primary benefit is that it gives you, uh, something to assess yourself off of. Um, you know, it's kind of like a trade. I mean, if you have a system that's fairly regimented. I mean, it doesn't have to have no discretion, right? I mean, but the bottom line is like at the end of a trade, you have a pretty good idea of where your execution lies because of the quality of your strategy and your system, right? If you don't have that, then you're kind of a, like a newer trader, just like you don't even know if you have an edge in the market. You don't even know if you're getting lucky or if uh, you have any actual skill. So goals kind of provide that same kind of measuring stick that that provides feedback um you know sometimes goals can be constricting right i I don't want them ever to be that way but i think sometimes people can uh diminish their utility because they think that they can't uh go beyond what they set in their mind Uh, another key benefit i think is is focus Uh, when we look at like focus is kind of like a flashlight like pointing in the direction of of what you want and so it kind of helps to remove the external noise outside of that kind of uh, the beam of light, so to speak, right? If, if you don't have goals, theoretically, it's okay to kind of be distracted by other things, kind of like as a, you know, w- within your strategy or system, if your strategy is, is weak, or, you know, you're in a, let's say a, a phase where things just aren't working, and, you know, you're a trader three to five years in, uh, you're struggling in this particular type of market, you're not really sure if it's you or, or, uh, or the market and you start trying, just trying to try a bunch of things, which could be fine, but you got to understand that you're kind of like in a research mode, right? You, you want to have a, a point where you can start to actually gain some valuable feedback to know that what you're doing is either working or has the potential to work long-term. Um, and if you don't set goals, uh, it's the same kind of thing, right? You, you you lose the ability to know what is kind of random focus from what is is like kind of properly designed, um, uh, you know, around the things that you want, right? So so you know, focus is like your tool to get the things done that you want. If you are distracted <clears throat> at a basic level, I mean, you're like everything gets worse, right? Your learning gets worse, your execution gets worse. Uh, so yeah, goals are, are really important for focus and they also remove a lot of the kind of mental bandwidth on a day-to-day decision-making a time frame, right? Like trading is very, very mentally intense. It, you burn a lot of energy day-to-day and, and traders underestimate uh, the, the, the significance of burnout, but setting goals makes things easier because you're just removing decisions, right? So you can kind of go with the old, uh, you know, Steve Jobs wearing a turtleneck to work every day. 
Yeah, right. It was a little bit of branding. We'll give them that. But it was also like an efficient decision uh, or like one less decision that he had to make that day. So, yeah, goals to kind of chop away at some of the responsibility you have day to day to uh, make decisions because you're just focused on execution. You're not trying to figure out like what you are trying to do today. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think the key thing that uh, resonates for me is how the heck do you measure what you're doing when you don't have a goal? It's like, it's like, you know, I'm going out the door. Where are you going? I don't know. Start the car (laughs) drive. When are you, when are you coming back? I don't know. Where are you driving to? I don't know. What streets are you taking? I don't know. I'm just driving. Uh, to me, it just seems like, Hey, if that's what you want to do, because you have a lot of free time and a lot of money, then so be it. But, uh, but if we're after results, we have to define what those results must look like. Yeah. Um, the next okay, thing sorry, I wanted- just, I'll give you sorry, one, one example here, because it, it, it kind of reinforces like the, the connection between process goals and result goals. And I did talk about this in the trading book, but I think it's just a great, a great example, right? In, in 1960, when John F. Kennedy said, we want to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, the scientific establishment at that point was kind of just happy to explore space which is kind of what you were talking about. They were kind of happy to get in their car and just go wherever <laughs> their interest took them. It was like kind of no, like there was no right or wrong. It was just exploration and their own curiosity is what, you know, kind of drove that. And everybody thought it was crazy to think that they could do it within a decade and they did it in nine years. And so, right, the result goal was defined and then it was up to the scientific community, the governments, like to, to figure out how to construct the infrastructure and build uh, you know, a rocket capable of, of taking a man to the moon or men to the moon uh, and, and back. So on a day-to-day time frame, you can have that. On a, on a monthly, yearly time frame, you can have the exact same thing. They, they work together when they work together well. So I have to throw this at you uh, <laughs> since you brought this particular example, but, you know, the specificity of that goal by John F. Kennedy um was largely largely driven by Sputnik and 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 the Russians getting there, right? It's just like it made us focus on this thing that the Russians were able to do first and uh, allocate the resources to NASA and not question what they're doing until they pulled it off. So there's urgency. And and why am I bringing this up in the context of trading? This is where it makes a big difference to trade in a prop shop or within a group or a community like convergence kind of a plug for convergent i guess but this is the thing for me this is why i always traded in a professional kind of environment with other traders because you can float around float along for a whole decade and not achieve anything but if you're sitting in an office where the person next to you is trading the same product in the same time frame and they're walking away with you know, 30, 40 grand a month, and you're sitting here on a simulator, there's a sense of urgency, kind of like Kennedy felt about space exploration. It's no longer, hey, let's do whatever. Let's fire off a rocket and see if it gets gets up there. It's actually, we have a target and a date to meet it. So this is a, a, a I just want to make that point because you, you kind of gave me a layup on that one. Yeah. Um, we do have it, some questions. Here's a powerful motive. Those. Yeah. Yeah. We do have some questions. I'm going to hit those. I'm not ignoring you, but we'll get through this. These first, can you give us a few tips of what an end of year assessment would involve? I think you already went through that. You shared that. Uh, How much time should a trader expect to spend on a monthly or end of year assessment? It, It kind of depends on how much you've done ahead of time, right? In terms of setting those goals. If you're kind of get at the end of the year and you're like, yeah, I kind of had some loose ideas, right? Nothing as formal as what I had shown before. Um, you know, I, I think if you want to spend maybe five, 10 minutes for a week or two, right? I mean, and I say five, 10 minutes per day for a week or two, you, you don't want to sit down and do it for an hour, two hours, three hours, and think that that's going to be sufficient because, you know, your ability to kind of recall what happened over the course of, of 12 months is really pretty poor. Um, you know, it's, it's again, kind of the, the, you'll end up with a, a fair amount of like recency bias and thinking, you know, more about like the last month or two as being like reflective of the year. Um, you really want to think about, all right, 
January, February, March, and maybe even go back and look at some of the trades, maybe go back and look at your, your, your journal and your logs and try to put yourself back in that space and time um, and, and, and help to evaluate yourself. Think about where your skill set was at that point. Think about what you were working on, what you were trying to improve on, what processes were, you know, either in, in development or, uh, you know, uh, getting fixed or, or, or tightened up, whatever that may be. Um, so to me, I think it's, it's kind of the consistency that really makes the, the magic here. Um, and, 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 you know, five, 10 minutes a day is, is perfectly reasonable. Um, uh, you know, you can of course do more, but I would still want you to have that consistency over, you know, a, a, a few weeks to really kind of vet and get everything out. I have to add that, uh, in my experience, allowing for that gap you know, starting and just doing 10 minutes, first of all, sounds a lot less daunting than, hey, I've got this 16 page worksheet that you got to <laughs> fill out. And then when you're doing something else, when you're mowing the lawn, doing the dishes, uh, taking a shower from that first 10 minutes, you start to get some ideas for your next 10 minutes. And that drives more ideas. You just give your mind, give your, your mind, um, this this time to just kind of remember and make those connections or recall those connections i think that's very very valuable trying to slam it through at the last week of the year when you're full of food from the festivities or whatever is very very difficult it's like very another cool. version of cramming so given uh, can you give us an idea of a goal setting mistakes that may it may be even your institutional clients get wrong what you know you deal with a lot of professionals what are some of the mistakes you see often? I think the biggest one is being far too P and L result, you know, kind of monetary focus. So I think what I've tried to do with that goals worksheet is to, is to create the balance um, to make sure that, um, you know, look, the results matter, especially in that space. Like your, your job is on the line. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, it's on the line because you're maybe too conservative, right? I've seen, I've seen that where, you know, uh, traders are, are playing a little, a little bit too safe to kind of keep their job and they end up losing it because that's not the ethic that um, that institution is really after. But the bottom line is, right, we, we still want to make sure that there are clear uh, skill goals, right? And when I say process goals, it's like, what are you doing to achieve those end outcomes? Like, how are you improving? Even if it's just, look, I have a good process. I want to nail it. I want to make it perfect every single day. I want to, you know, really be consistent regardless of what my kind of p l swings are with my daily process you know both in terms of like pre-market and post-market uh you know or it might be yeah i want to uh get better at, at coding to develop better indicators and better uh tools to help me scan um you know do more research and and you know uh, have more conversations with other traders it, it doesn't i, I there's the, the scope is wide in terms of what you can be doing to to better yourself uh, and to make it more and more likely that you'll achieve the end goals that you want. That that's the, the I think the biggest mistake that, that a lot of in, institutional traders get wrong. Frankly, a lot of, you know, retail independent traders as well. Um, you know, it's like you, you pick a number in your head that you want to make and, and you just <laughs> kind of, you know, aim at that. And it's, and you're, you're coming out at, you know, the beginning of the year, it feels like it's a clean slate, you know, sort of the, the fantasy of the fresh start, as I, I like to say, it's like why New Year's resolutions always, you know, tend to fail, because you're not really looking at the underlying skills that are going to produce the end outcomes you want. You're just like excited by the idea, and you think that that excitement and energy and enthusiasm and um, uh, you know inspiration is going to carry you through. When you know it, it really is going to depend on your skills, your processes, um, and and so yeah, it, it, I think I can't stress it enough that that's the biggest thing, and then. You know, this is probably less of a concern from the institutional side, um, mostly because they have like risk departments, they've got managers, they've got people that have their eyes on them all the time. So the like the problems that are most likely to derail them is, um, you know, kind of less of a, a, a big concern for them. Um, but for some, I, I, we still kind of go through that process. I mean, other goal setting mistakes, I think, would, would kind of fit in the category of what, what I mentioned earlier, which is. Uh, maybe setting your your sites too low and then exceeding them and then not having you know additional goals that, that you can um, sometimes with with clients um, what we'll do is if it's if it is like p l focused we'll set like three targets at the beginning of the year 
you know, what in your wildest imagination, like what's the top end that you could imagine yourself hitting? And then this year is really tough. The market is not providing the opportunities you want. You go through a period where, you know, you're just in a drawdown, not doing anything wrong. And so like, what is kind of the bottom end that you think is reasonable? And then what's that like, you're not, not midway between those two points. Usually we go kind of 30 to 40% of the way there, you know, what's like a reasonable target. And what that does is it provides you with something that feels tangible, that's achievable at all points throughout the year. So if things are going bad, you don't feel like, oh my God, I've got this huge mountain to climb to still reach my goals. I've still got kind of that low hanging fruit that I could still attain. If the year is going amazingly well, you still have a target that you're aiming at and keeps you driven. So that, that's one thing you can do to, at the start of the year, just make it a, a bit more kind of uh, uh, stable and motivationally. Yeah. I mean, if you come in thinking uh, back to the uh, New Year's resolution, you know, hey, I'm going to lose 50 pounds and I'm going to be, I'm going to hit the gym every single day of the year. And then next thing you know, you miss two days and it's just like, there goes that goal. I already failed. So why bother? Right. So if you have a target that's too high up and it's now even more impossible, especially in a drawdown, um, then, you know, you just give up on the whole thing. But it makes sense to have a low hanging target, a meat of the curve kind of attainable target. And then, hey, if everything is perfect and I'm throttling up pretty good, there's that target too. So let's hit you up with some questions. We've had several here. Um, this is one from Jay. What is your number one coaching instruction to help traders get into a flow state when everything is working? So uh, the question is common. And what I'll say is there's not an easy answer. Right. If there was, then I would be selling it for a lot more than I, I, I have. It. You know, like the flow state, the zone is much more about like kind of like a like a like a really good cocktail. You know, uh, sorry to Brian. You know, I know he's trying to stay sober here, but uh, I'm going to have a few <laughs> drinks in the next couple of weeks. Um, and, and, you know, a really good cocktail has like the right mixture and formula. And, and sometimes it kind of depends. Right. Uh, so you the number one advice I would give is to spend time to actually think about the factors that are most reliably connected to what's going to help you to get in the zone more often. Then you could also look at the factors that are most likely to take you out of it or prevent you from getting there. But once you understand those, those variables, uh, it, it then just becomes about trying to gain command and gain control of them. Uh, but even if you have full command and control, it doesn't mean you're going to get there, right? The market might, um, you know, create like a faux zone, right? It just like market's going crazy. You're you're feeling like really active. It's like you're not actually in the zone. There's just a lot happening, mm -hmm. uh, you know, versus to me, the differentiator with the zone is that you're accessing intuition. If you are accessing intuition, uh, you know, it's very likely that you're either, either in the zone or, or pretty close to it. If you're not, you're not in the zone. Okay. Jared, can I jump in just for a second, Moran? Sure. Go Jared, for it. do you think um, the the more you practice, and I'm going to steal a couple of your, of your terms, the more you practice and work at mapping your own internal emotional state, do you just organically become closer and closer and closer to being in the zone more often? Yes and no. <laughs> so, okay. so yes, um, if that mapping also helps you to identify the like, kind of underlying flaws that are just going to be kind of throwing a lot of noise in your mind on a regular basis. That, that, that to me is kind of the bigger piece of the puzzle to, um, uh, to kind of tease out. Uh, but if you know, to, so that's like kind of the no part, the yes part is like, if you know what it's like in an optimal state, right. And kind of that, uh, yeah, just very clear description of the zone, and, and you have a good sense of the factors that, you know, kind of help to line that up, then yes, there, there certainly can be just like a natural, like, I, I want more of that. Yeah. And, and that organic, you know, you start making decisions more automatically. Okay. I'm going to get to bed on time. I'm not going to dick around on my phone. I'm going to put it away. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to get up. I'm going to do my workout. I'm going to have my tea. I'm going to like, you start to see, you know, that, that the snowball can kind of move in that direction. I think that's what you're talking about, like kind of that organic 
move towards being at at your best more often certainly can happen the more you're paying attention to that emotional state sure uh, from mr anderson uh jared do you think the most elite poker players you've worked with can also be elite traders do you have any non-obvious or counterintuitive commonalities best practices of the highest level guys uh, so yes. Um, so in one of the institutional firms that I worked with, um, there was one of the guys, uh, who early on was actually having a lot of difficulty, but he was an elite poker player and I think struggling to make that transition. And, uh, I'm happy to say, you know, I don't know how many years it's been since I first worked with him, but yeah, he's killing it. I mean, he's actually killing it, uh, in trading. Um, got another guy, um, uh, out in Israel <laughs> who was, who, you know, one of the best poker players, you know, cash game players, nobody would ever know who he is. Um, but, uh, yeah, he was kind of running like a stable of other, of other poker players that he was coaching and backing and, um, and, and, you know, he kind of got tired of, of, of poker and has been recruited to a, a quant firm and he's helping them to develop, um, some, uh, quantitative uh, trading strategies. Um, what I would say is that, uh, by and large, right, like your understanding of, of variance and, and volatility like is 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 so parallel. I mean, I think trading has way more variance than poker, but like poker players by their nature, they want to kind of define the risk. And so, you know, you take like a random person off the street versus, a you know, compared to a poker player, like I, I would take the poker player a hundred times out of a hundred, um, you know, it, it, to uh, be like in a better position uh, at the beginning, will they make the best traders long term? No, right. Hundred times out of hundred, there's a lot other variables. One of which is is just like the love and passion that you have for it, right? Uh, I think to be elite at anything, you have to love what you do very deeply. It has to really, uh, you know, kind of check all the boxes for for who you are, your makeup, what you're interested in. Uh, you know, there are just some uh, some poker players uh, who will never be good traders because they just don't love the markets. They love the game associated with, with poker and, and, you know, they could be good traders, but I don't think they would ever, ever be elite uh, without that. Another question from Mr. Anderson, and then we're going to wrap up here. Mr. Anderson says, uh, as asking what a good way, to, what's a good way to, to reasonably assess how many goals one can handle. If there's three things I want to improve at, and those three each have three to four subcategories for improvement, is it better to just focus on one? Yeah. So like a lot of things for me, it, the answer depends. And, and so what we'd have to look at is like mm -hmm. how much mental bandwidth is required for uh, any one of those subcategory goals or even one of those top line goals. Like if they're, you know, fairly basic ideas that with uh, five to 20 minutes of preparation at the start of the day or, you know, reasonable, uh, you know, or like mild amounts of effort or energy throughout the day to attain you can take on three or four without, without much problem. But if you've got one <laughs> that is like really tough, I, I mean, it's going to take all of your energy and effort. Like, for example, you know, you take somebody that's got like a big tilt problem, right? Big anger problem in trading. If that is their biggest problem, I mean, I wouldn't take on anything else. I mean, you know, maybe there are pieces of it that are going to require, you know, again, better preparation, some adjustments to it. I mean, it's going to take all of your mental capital or sort of all of your excess mental capital to take that on while still trying to be, you know, a, a successful and profitable trader. So yeah, it, it's, it's really is like kind of a, like more of like a mental bandwidth, you know, energy intensity kind of question than, than just sort of like a sheer number. Got it. Okay. I'm going to hit you with this last question that you saw that you weren't supposed to see. What are the three <laughs> things you want to do better or more of in 2023, either personally or professionally? Yeah. So my, my top kind of non-professional goal, aside from the usual, you know, spend more time with family and all this stuff that, you know, sounds nice that we say at Thanksgiving and <laughs> kind of at my Thanksgiving, we, we did like kind of the, uh, the wheel of fortune rules where we kind of, you know, RIC, L &E, you know, all that, those, all that standard stuff we kind of put aside. So aside from that, like all the selfish goals for me are, um, to be a lot better at golf. Uh, you know, this is the, that's the thing that I, I love the most. That is the thing that checks all the boxes for me. Um, and, uh, you know, was, you know, my, my kind of professional aspiration when I was a kid. And so, you know, I've got an opportunity to play, uh, some big tournaments this year and, you know, I've been working really hard physically, 
you know, regained a lot of swing speed that, that I've lost a lot of mobility that I've lost and, uh, joined a club, got an instructor, got a, like I said, a trainer, uh, you know, kind of people behind me to, uh, make this thing happen, including my wife, who's going to hopefully be as patient as I'd prefer <laughs> with all this. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the big thing I want to accomplish, uh, you know, uh, personally, um, you know, professionally, uh, it's, it's kind of a constant, um, you know, you know, evolution for me in terms of my own, you know, evolution as a coach. Uh, but I think one of the things I want to really do better, because I think a lot of my work can be complicated, right? I, it's, I know I don't provide the kind of easy answers. I don't, I don't provide like the, the quick tips uh, that people want. Maybe today was a, uh, an example of what I'm already starting to work on, which is, is to just to kind of create more bite-sized, tangible things in, in really small spaces. Because um, as I kind of continue to, to grow, uh, I, I, I kind of go under this, um, uh, the, the Einstein quote, right? You know, you can't, you don't really understand something until you can explain it to your grandmother. And, and so for me, right, to be able to communicate complicated things in even more uh, simplistic terms is, is just kind of the evolution of my growth. And I know that when that happens, it kind of frees up mental capital for me to learn even more. So that, that would be a professional one. Um, and uh, one more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> pro- probably, probably. I mean, I, I, what's what's nice, and I, I will say the the kind of the personal one here. Um, it, it's we're we're kind of in a position now where I've, I've been living, you know, where I, I do uh, for the last uh, seven seven and a half years, um, and and I've I've done a lot of traveling. You know, pre COVID, it was kind of every three weeks with some esports teams and some trading firms and poker players and golfers. And, and even this last year was a lot. And I think I'm going to have the opportunity to kind of scale down a lot of that travel and, and just kind of have a lot more quality time with my family, with my friends and, and to try to be more, uh, more focused and, and, and a bit more, uh, kind of taking on too much. So, so yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, kind of the kumbaya. That's uh, a big one. Yeah. That requires yeah. a lot of discipline. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Like and, and also, you, you know, the discipline no. for me is just, is like saying no, you know, if it's not, yeah. I, I tend to get kind of sucked into too many opportunities that, you know, kind of sound nice in theory. Cause I'm, I tend to, I tend to be the person that's going to just like dive in head first and then figure out what's wrong with it after. Um, and, you know, being a little more thoughtful before I, uh, jump onto a, a brick of ice. Uh, <laughs> well, you said, you said yes to us tonight for showing up and you've just, uh, really, you're just another person that just kind of, uh, drinking out of a fire hose in terms of good information, uh, and applicable tools, uh, like the mem- mental ma- the emotional mapping technique that you talk about in your book. We didn't get to discuss that very much, but I want to remind everyone to just, Take a moment, follow Jared on Twitter, Twitter, twitter.com forward slash Jared Tendler. And of course, go to his website at jaredtendler.com. You can always drop him a note there. And uh, appreciate having you. Thanks for being here and, and uh, spending some of your evening with us. Always, Absolutely. Uh, always yeah, good love to be having here. you on. And I'll Cheers say too that if, if people want to have, uh, you know, they can download the worksheet that I showed today. The, the goals worksheet is on my website. So there's a lot of other free resources there that you can go to. So yeah, thanks. Uh, great to talk to you uh, as always, Morad. I wish you all, you know, kind of a happy holidays and happy new year. And yeah, great to see you as always. And we'll see you on the other side of uh, 2023. Cheers. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, thanks Jared. Jared. Thanks, Jared. Whew, man. All right. Well, we're getting down to the finish line here and we are going to talk to you two for just a minute. Uh, we, you know, I, I want to just introduce you again. Uh, you guys are seasoned traders. You are uh, what we call mavens in CT. You are guys in the uh, main chat room where we you share your homework, you share your your view of the market, and you're sharing a lot of experience by answering questions in our trading questions channels and so on and so forth. But I do have some questions for you. We'll run through these real quick. How has it been taking on the role of CT Maven? You know, they say that you don't really know anything until you're able to teach it. And you guys are now in this position. You've been in this position for a while this year. Uh, You took on a big challenge and you're doing fantastic. 
What changes have uh, have precipitated from becoming a CT Maven? Let's start with you, John. <clears throat> well, it's it's been really helpful for me, I think, because I'm constantly kind of reiterating the basics of what I do and just and constantly kind of improving my process because I have to put it out there every day. So it's really been a big help for me to just kind of reground myself in the in the the basics of of what i do well and that's follow a process and just be consistent every day so it, it's really helped me out a lot with that and and i really enjoy uh the opportunity to talk with so many other traders and uh i'll be honest with you kind of having the spotlight on you a little bit it it uh it it's good because it you know, it's an extra layer of accountability beyond, you know, having a partner or, or a group and whatnot. It, it's kind of like this extra sort of public layer of accountability, which is good. You know, it's, 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 it's good as a trader to have that. I really, I really believe so. You know, you can be, if you're just hiding, you know, in the basement trading futures, I mean, no one knows what you're doing or how, you know, no one knows about a mistake, but if you have to talk about what you're doing every day, you know, it kind of, it forces you, it, it pulls the slack out of what you're doing. So it's been very helpful for me, for sure. And thank very you for the cool. opportunity, of course. Uh, what about you, Brian? Uh, how's it been to be a, a CT maven? You know, I think it's it's along similar lines to John. I think there's an added level, level of discipline. You can't, you know, you might come in some days if you don't have that accountability and, and just not do the work that you really know you're supposed to do but when you've got other people waiting for it or looking for it um so th there's an added level of uh, accountability that ends up being good for you i also agree with john when he said um people hitting you with questions in the, in the other channels i i i welcome that um especially sure. the, the mental uh edge channel uh it, you know it when you have to go back and touch on things that you might not ordinarily go back and touch on it helps you you know it regrounds you it uh you know it just refreshes stuff that you already know by going back and touching on it again and and you know this this theme of you don't really know it till you can explain it to somebody else gets reiterated in those questions so there I, I i love getting hit with questions in there so and Very i think cool. um you know there was there's a learning curve with everything and uh there's i think there was a learning curve coming into this not to, that that you you know not to overdo it not to embellish just to try and um keep yourself grounded and do what you do and and keep it consistent so yeah it's that. easy to get lost uh by trying to get fancy it's yeah. easy to lose your process uh which is something we didn't talk about enough today but uh, i'm going to hit you up with this other question here you've been trading a long time what have you seen this year that keeps repeating as a theme for struggling traders? So you you're interacting with a lot of, a lot of members within Convergent. What what is the theme that kind of keeps hitting you? We'll start with you, Brian, this time. Yeah, good. Uh, you know, you you Morad is very well known for anybody who doesn't already realize this for his anecdotes, and he always seems to have one, and they always seem to touch a nerve. At least for me, they they very often do. And your analysis, when you were talking to Jared and you said, it's like getting in the car and just, you know, where are you going? I don't know. I'm just going, um, which is something coincidentally we used to do as youth. That, that was one of the things we did in our youth that, the, you know, was just to get in the car and drive around and see go what for we a drive, you yeah, know, we're, go we had cruising. no destination or no goal in mind. That was, you know, just going out and go. And it also describes the first large part of my trading career is that I was just kind of aimlessly bouncing, you know, just kind of floating around the industry, you know, just uh, didn't have enough accountability and focus, you might say. And so when I came in contact with the right people who asked the right questions in the right way at the right time, Jared's book, uh, I'm I'm someone for whom it, it came along at a, at a very opportune time. These pieces started to, to kind of fall together. And really, I was put me on the right track to make the turn and and become a, a successful trader and i think the theme that i i see is is that that people are kind of 
aimlessly, not complete. I don't, I don't want. I don't mean that term. I don't mean to use that term derog in a derogative manner. There, but they haven't. You know, they don't have the right. Um, they have the right intent, but they don't have the right approach yet. You know, they haven't like figured out the first part of, you know, my favorite question, what, what kind of trader are you or what kind of trader do you want to be? Um, and then, you know, develop a process for becoming that, that trader. Uh, so that's what I see is I see people struggling with that, you know, and because when you don't have that, that, specific direction in mind and you haven't figured out what kind of trader you know you can't just step up to a screen and say oh i want to be this you don't know what you want to be until you start and that's that's a difficult thing with this with this um with this business too is you can't really know what kind of trader you want to be until you start trading so, so it's kind of a catch-22 um but that's what i see is i see people kind of not not grasping onto that yet yeah, it's hard to know where to start. John, do you want to add to that or take take uh, take it in a different direction, maybe? Well, I, I'd agree with everything that Brian said. Um, what I was going to chime in for, for something that I've noticed a, a little bit different kind of builds on it is, um, one, you know, once folks are sort of committed and and start to have a process and whatnot, it seems like sometimes – people can either sort of focus totally on the mental game or totally on their technical game, like one or the other. Like they think the, the whole answer is their mental game, but maybe their system isn't polished or they need, you know, something about their system or an indicator. That's like the Holy grail, but they're not paying attention to the, the mental game. Really. I, I think that the sweet spot is, is kind of understanding that, you need to work on both. And a lot of times issues you have are going to, you know, an issue in one place is going to play off the other, like an issue in your mental game. And this is something from Tendler's book, actually an issue in your mental game might be popping up because your system isn't polished enough and you're forcing yourself to make too many decisions in the heat of the moment. And that's causing tilt. That's causing some other mental problem. So, I think that that's something I see with a lot of people that you got to you got to look in both places. And a lot of times when you find something like maybe this mental game error, you know, maybe the way to solve it is actually by polishing your system and taking away the, you know, taking away this need to make some crucial decision at a time when you're you're just not capable of making that decision. So that's that's kind of a theme I've noticed with, with some people, myself so included at times. I'm going to hit you with this question that uh, we we asked you in the Trader Spotlight that we did uh, when you guys came on. What are three quick key tips that have made a difference to your own trading? Let's start with Brian on this. And uh, we're short on time, so the quicker the better. Sure. Um, when I started, when you know what kind of trader you want to be, I think is tip number one. Like, you know, I keep driving that home to everybody. Know what you want to do and know who, know what kind of trader you want to be. And then have confidence in the fact that you can be that trader. I think that's, that's hugely important that, you know, you can, you know, you have to accept the fact that you can actually do this. Um, I think our human nature is more leads us towards all oh, this isn't going to work, but you know that you can do it, have that confidence. And then, Accept the outcome. Learn how to not be so outcome oriented and accept what the market gives you at the end of each day. As long as you follow the process. As long as you followed your process. Sure. Yeah. John, what are you going to hit us with? Okay. Very quickly. Um, develop a consistent routine. If you, if you don't already have a consistent routine, and that's everything from, you know, what you do before you trade to after it, um, you know, the more consistent, the better. The second tip is, I think you I think a good ritual for beginning the trading day and ending the trading day is very helpful to kind of bookend your execution hours with some type of a ritual that you know gets you ready and then cools you down, helps you review. And the third one is <laughs> from the hip. Uh, I kind of ran out. Those are my two. But um, be easy on yourself. That that'll be my third tip. Be 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 uh, compassionate to yourself when you have bad days or when you have good days. So that, that's my third tip. Self-compassion. Very cool. Very cool. So um, 
now we're going to wrap it up and ask you this, this question, John, since you were just on. What are the three things you want to do better or more of in 2023, personally or professionally? Okay. My three things, I wrote them down. Uh, the first and most important is I want to spend more time with my family, which is kind of cliched, but it's true. Uh, you know, I, I want to see my parents more, see my sister and her husband more, and they're, they're, uh, they're my nephew, their son. They have a second one on the way. So really, I want to spend as much time as I can with my family. That's the first one. Uh, the second one is I want to compete, get back to competing in jujitsu, get back into competition this year. And the third one is, of course, I want to improve on all of my personal bests in trading. Those are my goals. Very cool. Brian. Sure. Uh, so what allowed me to make the turn and become a successful trader was, you know, improvement in my mental game, clarity, being calm. Uh, so I want to just continue that that progress and just get better and better at that. Um we moved from Chicago to Indiana this year, and I want to get this house completely remodeled, get that finished, and get my uh, situation settled. That's a, that's a major goal coming into 2023. And then, uh, you know, again, I'll have to follow the cliche, but I do want to spend more time with my family. Uh, you know, I've always been driven and outcome oriented and career oriented and my wife and i have earned the the right to spend and enjoy more time together so i want to do i want to do a lot more of that my son is in college he's about to be out of he's going to be out of college soon enough and he's going to you know start taking on a life of his own so i think it's important that i spend as much time with him as i can and this move to indiana was pretty was uh driven by my daughter who got married here in indiana and she's going to spend her life here in indiana so we moved here to, uh, you know, not, no pressure, but we're hoping they have grandkids at some point. Um, <laughs> oh my God, better. that's a lot of pressure. So, uh, <laughs> uh, what are you waiting for? Yeah, <laughs> so hopefully spending more time with with uh, with them as well. Man, Brian B is a granddaddy. That's that's not yet, that's gonna but be interesting. That's going to be interesting. Days, hopefully. So uh, a couple questions here in general. Um, for FT, if you have 10 traders like Brian and John, will you have a prop shop business again? Or is uh, it's not uh, just about the quality of traders? Uh, you know, a prop shop is not a funding company. I this, That's where I got my start. This is something I'd love to do again, to be honest with you. But the commitment and the just the grueling process of taking traders on, evaluating them, and then bringing them to the point where they are sustainably profitable are, you know, that's a very tough uh, thing in, in having kids and being older now. You know, I, I started this, I uh, started prop, sh prop shopping 20 years ago. Um, it's, it's something I'd love to do. The, some of the best memories and breakthroughs I had was when I had, traders working for me and I was just all I did was show up manage the trader you know show up trade manage traders and help build them up uh, that was extremely rewarding and I'm doing this on a uh, kind of a parallel I'm doing it at, uh, what do you call it on a on a proxy basis through convergent trading that's what convergent trading is it's my way of continuing to evolve and learn from others and have a community and influence people, have an impact on people's lives. Uh, I set out to really have a positive impact on everybody that's around me a long time ago. And that's what drives me. So that's key for me. Uh, so it is something that I'd love to do, but I'm not sure if I have the energy uh, or, or might, might have the opportunity to be able to be able to do it again. Um, a question for you both. If you have a 90% win rate taking a few ticks, should that be exploited or should one work on dropping down to 50% win rate for more ticks? What do you guys think? What kind of trader do you want to be? <laughs> yeah, Brian's going to go right to that. I mean, listen, if you're a scalper and that's what you love doing and that works for you, then that's what you do. Yeah. I. It's hard to keep that working for a it would be for term, me, I but think. I'm not, you know. Yeah, for someone else, it probably is. Look, stick with what works, right? That's the that's the basic gist of it. Yeah, for me. John, what do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, there's not enough information there to really give a good answer. But I mean, I would go with the strategy that makes the most money that you're able to execute the best, regardless of what the, the win rate is. You know, if it's 30%, but you're making more money than your strategy with 50% winners and go with one that makes 30%. That's, yeah, I mean, that's what I would do. Whichever strategy makes you the most, you're able to execute the most consistently on. That's the winner. Yeah, I, mean, I, the one... take, I take fewer trades during the day um, than most people sure. in the RTY, but my targets are a little bit longer. And it's just, you know, it's what fits me. That's what works for you. Yeah, just to make sure you have a, a process that works for you. And that's going to evolve over time anyway with the market. Very cool. And then Jay's asking me uh, mm -hmm. what my three goals for 2023 are it's the same goals as every year to just same problem as jared i just dive in head first with things and i want to do everything all the time and uh one of the key pieces is to just slow down so i can enjoy what's around me i've got a i've got a, a daughter who just uh who's going to turn one in two days i've got another daughter who's four and a half years old she's fantastic i've got a 20 year old and a 17 and a half year old there's just a lot going on and uh i need to be more picky with what i do uh that's a that's a key piece I'm, every year and this is why john and brian are here john and brian are are helping me achieve a goal of just allowing others to kind of step in do their part and expand and grow and uh, benefit and help others benefit as well. Uh, so I'm always working towards that goal. The second is really health. You know, I'm 51, you know, future trader 71, you do the math. I'm 51. I don't feel like I'm 51, but I feel like my body at some point is going to remind me that I'm 51. <laughs> so I need to really pay attention. I'm not in the healthiest. Um, I don't have any issues, but I'm not at the healthiest weight or fitness level. I used to love to be keto and all this stuff, and I'm not doing any. Since the pandemic, it's been like right out the window, all of it. And I feel it every day. I feel like I could be a better athlete. I could go back to maybe running. I had intended to run a marathon in 2020. Well, that got scrapped. I ran a half marathon the year before that. I'd love to achieve that milestone of, of uh, running the Chicago Marathon, and I really need to get in shape to do that. And then the last piece is I have some really important professional goals that I can't disclose here that I really need to start uh, you know, just, just achieve. I need to be disciplined enough to focus on the things, uh, that I've said I'd build and to go ahead and build them so I can move on to other things. Uh, those are the three pieces, just kind of be more selective, be more focused, uh, my, my health so that I can be more available for these little, uh, wonderful girls and, and so I can be here for them for longer and then to really start clearing my slate and accomplishing the goals that I'd set out to do many, many, many years ago. I'm working on them, but it's very hard to execute these things. Those are my goals. And I'll throw this question back to you, every one of you who's listened today, and I appreciate you all coming on. Make sure you have some goals for 2023. There's, you can make a lot of money, you can lose a lot of money, you cannot regain time. You cannot make time. So make sure you're using your time wisely and you're doing something that you love and that is effective for you in the long run. i leave you with that. I want to invite you all to, of course, check out Convergent Trading. Um, you know, there's a lot we're doing. You can go to convergenttrading.com and, of course, at a minimum, subscribe to the channel that you're watching and set notifications. We put a lot of content out and then follow on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash conf trading. I want to thank uh, both John and Brian and all of our guests for coming on. Also Landau behind the scenes for making this happen. And I really appreciate every single one of the people who've uh, followed, who have supported and who participated, participated today. Thank you all and I'll catch you at the next show. Thank you. Thank you, Morad. Take care. Cheers, Thanks, guys. everybody. Bye.